So greetings and welcome to the fall pack meeting. Not quite fall, but we call it fall nonetheless. Because we've got a couple of days to the official fall. But um, very good to have you here. Lots of exciting things going on in the working groups to be reported upon today. So this is an important one. This is the draft actionable recommendation time. Time to begin to coalesce on the things that we'll close out in December and present to the FCC for their, their attention and action. We've had a lot of success, as you all would recognize, with the recommendations that have been provided, one of which is going on next door, the role that we've had in uh, creating the CBRS spectrum, the 3.5 gigahertz, and the, the effort that's being announced this morning. I think Julie is, is still next door and perhaps a couple of others that are involved in that, in that uh, presentation and kickoff activity. We have a great deal to do today, and we'll, we'll get right to it, but we have a couple of important items to, to come up with first, and a couple of people to recognize. First one is the, the tear in the eye recognition for John Barnhill. John has been with us and contributing greatly for quite some time, and he is going off to other adventures, and part of his departure and movement from Alanza to bandwidth.com uh, will move him to a place where the TAC is no longer in the, the center stage as he, as he moves. So we will miss John, but we'll try to find a way to sneak you back in here as time goes on because your contributions have been so strong and so significant over the years. But we really, really do appreciate what you've done. <coughs> And please, I announce that up front so that you have an opportunity to personally connect with John, since you may not have as, as many opportunities to engage him as ha you have in the past. Second one, uh, Scott uh, uh, Roban is, is moving from Juniper to Nokia, and as such, since we already have a representative from Nokia, he will be stepping down from, from that role. Uh, so and Scott is not here, but uh, Vince Spino is right there, and we welcome Vince as the new representative for Juniper. So please introduce yourself to Vince and, and engage with him. Um, I don't see him here, but we have a, a, a new, um, I won't say old, but seasoned member of the TAC who is returning there was a little mix-up, but Jesse Russell will be returning to the TAC. He was here last time as a, as a guest, <laughs> and, but he is back and is a part of the, the TAC. So that's our personnel agenda for this morning. Um, we do have a couple of other items that I'd like to highlight. One is that this being the, the, the Next to the last meeting of 2019, it's time for us to be focusing on what we will do for 2020. Time does fly by, so be thinking and submitting your proposals for a working group for the coming year or your perspective that the working group that you're on right now has much more to be done and that you would recommend that we continue with the, the working groups that are already there. We, the presumption is that we will get off to a good start. Had conversation with with Michael even this morning about the the working groups for next year, and, and it's oh my gosh, we've got so many things going. How are we going to do it? But we will press forward, and I'm sure we will by January we'll for sure have the working groups all lined up every year. That's our goal, and as those of you who are knowledgeable would know we never quite seem to make it by that early date, but we will be striving to once again to have things in place and, and in place quickly. Um, the final item and really important item is to recognize Brian, Mark Walter, and CTA who have provided our lunch for today. So as you're uh, enjoying exactly your... The same as 
but nonetheless, we do appreciate that. And uh, so thank, make sure that you thank Brian for the provision of our food for today. And with that, uh, let's make a quick run around the room, introducing those around the table. Uh, make sure that we have all the identification of faces and names. And, um, then we'll go to those who are who've dialed in. So, Michael Ha, PFO at FCC. Brian Mark Walter, CTA. Tom Swanabori, CTIA. Lynn Spinner, Juniper Network. Paul Meisner at Amazon. Steve Lanning, Viasat. <laughs> Jack Michalski from Qualcomm. Lynn Merrill with NTCA. And serve you of Carnegie Mellon University, but serving here as a special government employee. Adam Drobot, Open Tech Works. Lisa Guest, Cradle Point. Uh, John Chapin, representing National Spectrum Consortium. Stephen Hayes, Erickson. Joe Kramer, The Boeing Company. Greg Lappin, ARRL. Marty Cooper, Dyna LLC. Ryan Daly, AT&T. Russell Jurek, Cisco. John Barnhill, Alianza. Mark Bayless, Visual Link. David Young, Verizon. Paul Steinberg, Motorola Solutions. Mark Hess, Comcast. Kevin Letty, Charter. Jeff Forrester from Intel. Uh, Dale Hatfield, University of Colorado. <laughs> Eric Berger, FCC CTO. Great. And now for those who have dialed in, do we have members on the phone? Travis Russell Madeline. from Oracle. Madeline Nolan, ATSC. Okay, we welcome the three of you as well. And we'll try to ensure that your voices are well heard and, and recognized as you have comments to add to the group. Let me, we don't have Julie here yet from next door, but Michael, do you have any opening comments? Um, we are about halfway through, um, so this is a September meeting, and uh, as we all know, December meeting is on the 4th of December or Wednesday, um, so we hope to get the uh, last mile connected and have all the final recommendations, as Dennis emphasized, it's coming to the commission. Um, also, I just wanted to uh, share the agenda for today's meeting. Um, slides, please. So we'll start out with uh, the, the artificial intelligence working group as the sitting arrangements you can see, uh, followed by the UAS working group. We'll break for lunch and we'll pick it up with antenna working group. I'm sure uh, you know Greg and Marty will keep us awake. And then we'll uh, uh, close the meeting with 5G and IoT working group. And hopefully we'll be able to close it up by 2.30 so that people who need to connect catch their flights in the afternoon will be able to do so, and I think Julie just came in in time. <laughs> Therefore, do you have any words of, of wisdom, pearls of knowledge to present? Let me breathe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so just a little bit. So welcome, everybody. Um, are we on here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the reason I'm a little bit late, I just came from the CBRS ONGO <laughs> session uh, and was struck by how, you know, the idea for the multi-stakeholder process, which really came out of the Spectrum Group, uh, uh, took root there and has been just enormously successful. Uh, and it's very gratifying to see <laughs> that those seeds, which really started out as how can we deal with the issue of adjacent channel interference and who's responsible between the transmitters and receivers and so forth and kind of morphed into a, a place to apply those principles uh, in 3.5. And, uh, you know, yeah, it took a while, but uh, it really, I think, is a terrific outcome and just listening to some of the innovative ideas. Uh, and uh, just turning to the things that we're working on now, you're working on, um, just to to let you know how much we appreciate and how much it matters <laughs> into things, ideas that the commission takes seriously. Uh, I think, you know, the topics that we're looking at here, 5G we've been working on for a while. I think some of the initial work on millimeter waves really sprang from work that came out of the TAC. Um, 
And uh, of course, 5G is more than just the millimeter waves, but uh, it really sparked uh, the work here on that topic. And when we look at antennas and some of the issues that, you know, in the antenna working group is wrestling with about uh, how do we do interference analysis, how do we model these antennas, um, I think is vitally important as we're looking at uh, increased spectrum sharing and interference protections and so forth. Uh, for UAS, uh, we've been wrestling for a while with, you know, what are the right spectrum solutions for UAS and how do we uh, support that? Uh, and uh, I think the work, I, I took a look at the slides, uh, work there that's been going on there has been terrific. Uh, not an easy problem. Uh, and I'm, what's the fourth group I'm leaving out? This was a test for all of you. Yes, AI. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's the artificial part of the intelligence yeah, that was struggling with. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, could use more of it. Uh, um, you know, it really is looking down the road as AI is developing and how does that play into the, the activities that the commission conducts? How does it play into the services uh, that we'll see deployed? How does it play into spectrum management and so forth? So was also gratified to see uh, some of the ideas that are coming out of that working group. Uh, there are still a lot of unknowns <laughs> about how AI is going to be, but, but to start the process of thinking about that seriously and, and how it might play into the things that the commission needs to be aware of or take a look at as it goes forward, I think is really important. So I uh, apologize for going on so long, but just to tell you, you know, that for all of your investment and time and energy in the work groups and coming here, uh, we really appreciate it and it does matter. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Julie. Now, it, it is why we're all here, of course. We are making an impact and making an impact on the long term. So it's, it's terrific. So unless there are other comments from anyone, we will jump into our agenda. And I would note that we're jumping in a couple minutes early so we can keep that going right through the day. And we'll start out with artificial intelligence. Lisa Guess, you're on. Here we are. Um, thanks, for the, thanks for helping set up my topic so beautifully just now. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I feel like so many, so many uh, concrete things are going on. And the CBRS launch this morning was an exciting concrete evidence of the work that this team does. And, and as you nicely pointed out, AI is very much in its early stages. So we, you know, we, we started some work last year. Uh, you know, we're going to continue through this year and be setting up more focused goals for next. So that's, you know, this is just, this is a journey. And we're probably a third of the way through. So just kind of to, to kick that off. Um, same uh, working group members, just, I just want to give a shout out. The team has been especially engaged. Um, I think we've had more than a quorum every meeting, and, and thank you to all of you. And, and in particular, this presentation was, had, was quite a bit of group input. So, you know, a big shout out to the whole team. And uh, let's, let's talk about the charter. So I, we, we've already <laughs> covered that a bit, but essentially this group, I, I like to remind us of our charter. It's a continuation of what we did in 2018, which was basically computational power and stress on the network, which led us to focus on artificial intelligence. And our, uh, one of our main tasks this year is really to find information and understand um, what the FCC would need to know about artificial intelligence, and in particular, <coughs> how it relates to the network, how we operate the network, how it might help the FCC. So that's, that's our charter, and I, I think we've made some good progress um, in this quarter as we, as we delve deeper um, into this. So, uh, you know, we're peeling away the layers of the onions. We probably peeled away about two layers at this point. And, uh, you know, with that, Adam, I'm going to have you talk to the next slide to talk about what AI applications are already employed. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, uh, you know, if I look at uh, sort of across our uh, working groups, 
the first thing I think you'll find is that AI uh, isn't just something in the offing. Uh, there is quite a bit of it uh, already deployed. And um, uh, I think we, we took a look at uh, uh, four of the major players in communications, AT&T, Verizon, Spectrum, and Comcast. And uh, if you comb their websites, if you look at the comments from their participants, uh, all of them have significant investments and deployments in AI, even at this point in time. While there's a lot more to come, I think one shouldn't lose sort of sight of the fact that there's a lot of things that are already going on. Okay. So uh, if I look at it, uh, AT&T, uh, customer interactions and chatbots, uh, I think the public is finding uh, uh, networks, how to configure them, computing, uh, puzzling and complex in many respects. Uh, so creating interfaces backed by AI tools, uh, fairly common at this point. So it's not just uh, an AT&T, but it's an example of, uh, uh, you know, of, of that kind of use. Uh, the next thing is uh, digital customer experience. I suspect almost every major uh, uh, provider uh, is uh, uh, investing in that. Uh, uh, if I look at sales, uh, uh, marketing, uh, sort of assistance uh, with that that help you walk through what your options are, uh, a lot of AI tools built into it. Uh, if you look at the network itself, uh, I think we had a little bit of controversy in the group, uh, did some homework. Uh, if you look up SDN and uh, AI, you will find project after project and almost every major service provider and almost every major vendor at this point in time. Uh, next generation technologies for the enterprise where you can incorporate a lot more uh, complexity in what you do, process flows, things of that sort. Uh, again, AI. So if you look at it, it's an important technique or a set of tools, and the main things that it drives is automation <coughs> and autonomy. Uh, and uh, again, uh, if you look at some of the responsibilities of the FCC, I think it helps the operators anticipate and mitigate conditions that lead to disruptions, among other things. Uh, they can deal with efficiency. Uh, so network performance and management is on there, uh, and also predictive maintenance in terms of looking after uh, uh, the infrastructure and telecommunications. Okay. So a lot going on, and the thing to get across is, while it's early in some respects and we've only gone part of the way, uh, there is already an awful amount of stuff that's been, an awful lot of stuff that's already been deployed at this point. Okay. Um, I'd say the, the next, uh, next view graph, uh, if, yeah, we've got to advance to that, okay, uh, is uh, what we intend to do uh, uh, for the AI working group for the rest of this year. And the first part of it is identify high impact applications. Uh, so this is a fairly hard task because if you look at applications of AI uh, that are related to the FCC's mission, uh, there are an awful lot of them. It's uh, you know, sort of uh, dealing with the ocean in some respects, of figuring out some kind of a framework uh, where we can talk about it and zero in on things that are uh, really going to dominate as important. So as part of that, we've had a number of experts that have come in. I will say more about that. Uh, concentrating on things like network, ar network automation, <coughs> impacts uh, on architectures, uh, and again, I'd say flavor from last year. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the cloud, the edge, processing, other technologies that are just not, not necessarily only in telecommunication. Uh, and then lastly, uh, looking at uh, applications at the FCC itself. Uh, so how can the FCC uh, sort of better perform its mission, optimize its workflows, things of that sort. So I think the, uh, the main uh, outcomes we're looking for is a briefing at the end of the year that sort of provides a broad education uh, about uh, 
uh, what AI is all about, uh, lay the plans for uh, continuing the mission of the working group into 2020, uh, and to develop a number of uh, uh, actionable recommendations, essentially. Okay. Okay, great. So, so we I, we showed this funnel slide last time, and I, I feel that we've made some good progress on the funnel. We, we you know, as as a, as has been pointed out, this is a big topic. It covers everything from, you know, even if you narrow it down to things relative to the FCC, it's still a big topic, and it has multiple facets. So I, you know, I'd say we're starting to narrow down, and today we're going to really spend most of our time diving into the use cases. So that's that's the point we've gotten to, and uh, that that will be what informs a lot of our work for the rest of the year. So. What are these buckets of use cases? So we've we've done some analysis, put uh, put a variety of things in these buckets, and we find they, as we expected, AI technologies for use by the FCC will be very important. We have several use cases to cover there. Technologies for use um, for network use by operators and service providers. That's probably an almost limitless set of things, but we feel we've really identified some a, a set of high impact use cases there. Also, technologies for important and critical applications. We we've, we've gone back and forth on what to call this. Is this industrial applications? Is it enterprise applications? So it, that's essentially all those things fall into this bucket. And then the final one, we've really started to flesh this one out too. It's it's uh, what is the dark side of AI, and how will the bad actors use AI in an effort to cause harm? I think this one's especially important because if we can get ahead of it and think about what nefarious things might go on, this will definitely uh, you know help us to avoid maybe some things that that. Uh, could potentially be uh, not not helpful as an understatement to to the cause here. So, um, Adam, with that, why don't we jump into technologies for use by the FCC? Okay. Um, so again, uh, when we look at this, this is not a complete list. Uh, I think we have tried to seed this with potential uses. Uh, there are probably some things left out at this point, but. Uh, uh, at the least, it gives you an inkling uh, of uh, you know where it is that uh, uh, the FCC might take advantage of AI techniques. So the first one is, uh, uh, and we try to use as simple language as possible for this in terms of uh, uh, what we label the use cases. Probably needs a little bit of uh, tightening up, I would say. But let me uh, start off with the following. So the first one is uh, on the enforcement side is identification of uh, infractions, who the players are, what they're doing, uh, everything from better geolocation, sources of interference, uh, and either annoying or uh, uh, nefarious acts on the network. Uh, again, AI tools and AI techniques uh, could help very much in this kind of setting. Uh, the next thing I think we've heard uh, uh, this uh, as part of the conversation by the TAC uh, over the last couple of years is uh, uh, detection of things like jammers. They're supposed to be illegal. Uh, if you go on the web, you will find uh, lots of advertisements of how you can get uh, the greatest jammers uh, possible. Uh, amazingly enough, a lot of military technology that ends up in the marketplace uh, faster than you would ever suspect. Uh, and um, again, uh, using uh, AI tools to crawl the web, understand who's doing it, what the patterns are, uh, you know, fairly straightforward kind of use. And uh, if you were sitting on the commercial side facing something similar, you'd have probably deployed these kind of tools at this point in time. So whether the FCC does it by itself or has somebody do it on its behalf, uh, it's worthwhile having a cadre of people uh, who are sort of familiar with uh, uh, with the offerings. Robocalling, uh, I suspect that there is already uh, uh, you know, a significant amount of activity uh, of uh, you know, how to deal with this. And uh, again, sort of two-edged, because uh, the guys on the bad side 
definitely use AI in how they <laughs> stage their uh, robocalling, things of that sort. And I think uh, to make that uh, equation uh, much more even, uh, worthwhile considering what can be done there. Uh, the FCC runs a lot of databases. Uh, again, if you look at the pattern across um, uh, various um, uh, U.S. agencies and departments, more and more of them are sort of adding the analysis tools to their databases. So it's a lot easier for the public and the end users to actually get value out of them. And you'll find that many of those AI tools, uh, many of those tools, in fact, have AI uh, built into them. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, if, if I were to, uh, uh, to pick on something, one of the working groups looking at antennas is looking at aesthetics, uh, crawling the web, looking at what everybody's doing for aesthetics, who's got good designs, where is the good reception for it, you know, as analysis of uh, putting together that kind of material, where are the complaints coming from, uh, are there particular groups you know, doing this, uh, the, the, you know, what are various stakeholders think about the issues. Uh, again, AI tools could be very useful in the way you approach something of that sort. Uh, so I think databases, uh, the same thing on uh, impact outages and their restoration, uh, again, using AI tools. I can tell you from my experience, there are a number of industries uh, who, after much uh, consternation, sort of managed to start pulling information together uh, on equipment or tools that go bad. They share it. Uh, it tells everybody uh, how to build better networks, things of that sort. So uh, again, something worthwhile doing. <coughs> uh, very much on spectrum management. If you're eventually looking for efficiency uh, in spectrum management, uh, how to build out the network, things of that sort. Uh, again, uh, uh, everything from uh, how to use AI tools uh, to choose the connection that you're going to have, uh, both by the carriers, and I think it's uh, sort of fairly important for the FCC to understand the patterns uh, uh, of what goes on there. Complex rules and regulations, uh, you'll find AI by itself is a fairly large field, has many aspects to it, so being able to parse documents, understand what they say, uh, see where they have contradictions, things of that sort. Good for lawyers, predominantly uh, uh, the uh, pattern at the FCC in many ways. What, what contradictions? What contradictions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and by the way, understanding what the rest of the world is doing in terms of its rules and things of that sort. So you either have an army of scri scribes go through it uh, or you automate the process. Uh, leveraging information from the FCC call center, uh, uh, you know, comments that come in, things of that sort, and uh, didn't put it on here. I think somebody suggested things like, you know, we have DDoS attacks when you look at security, things of that sort. Again, what can AI tools uh, help to help to do for you there? Uh, I'm sure that this list could be extended. Uh, I think <coughs> what we're striving to do is to actually. Uh, you know, fill in the list as much as possible, but then to really filter down and say, here are the centers of interest, here's where we think the biggest impacts can be, and that's the filter that uh, uh, Lisa showed earlier. Okay. Great. So, so now let's move on to uh, AI technologies for network use by operators and our ser service providers. So we, we talked about spectrum management. I did not forward. There we go. Now I forwarded. Uh, we talked about spectrum management in the other bucket, but actually we felt that I think this will end up being one of our top use cases, and it actually falls into the network operator bucket as well on how do we, uh, how do we optimize spectrum usage, how do we minimize interference. So I, it, rather than just repeat it here, I thought I'd call that out again. <laughs> so support for granular slicing. So the, uh, how do you balance virtual resources? How do you... Um, uh, you know, lever leverage those resources, and this is a very complicated thing for humans to manually do and to do very efficiently. So I think this is an area where we'll do a lot of, of digging into, a lot of group participation on this topic. 
The, the next one is, this is a fairly big topic as well. So network and service management, security, privacy, and pro probably each one of those could end up being their, their own line there. But how do we optimize the user experience? How do we minimize risk and security breaches? How can AI help with, with this as well? Um, of course, there are more, you know, there are automated ways to do some of these things today. Um, AI will continue to make that even better and more efficient. You know, how do we, and you need to think about things like the control plane, the user plane, um, and, and how do you mitigate risk in those areas? And of course, all kinds of jamming and spoofing, you know, spectrum spoofing, the traditional kinds of spoofing. How do, we, how do we minimize that and also maximize the optimization of the network? So this is, a, again, a very rich topic. Number three with two-sided markets. I, I think it's been really nice having uh, an economist on our team this year um, in Mark Bikowski. So, you know, thank, thanks to him, you know, he he's brings us back to the market aspect of things as well. So how do we deal, you know, not deal with, but how do we analyze things also through the lens of the marketplace and how will AI impact that? How will that, uh, you know, affect and balance both sides as, as we, we work through that? The provider, the, the consumer, and, um, you know, I, I think, uh, Net neutrality might be an example that we had discussed as well. You know, that's probably an early example. We'll find more of that. So that's a that's a really rich topic that I, I think we'll spend more time on as well before we finish finish up for this year. And uh, let's go forward a slide. And so another couple of things for network use is uh, interference mitigation. So I, I think we had a great example of that with our launched this morning and just some discussions on how important interference mitigation currently is and will continue to be and grow in importance. And, and in particular, um, you know, we're out here doing kind of a listening tour with our own customers and partners and that's one of the concerns is th things may work great right now, but what happens in 20 years when there's a hundred times as, as much data and as much need for usage. So that's going to become more and more important. And, and especially as, as sensors become more prevalent. And then finally, I, I talked a little bit about improved customer experience earlier. So what is the user experience? And can we um, even go further and use things like location to maximize that customer experience? And I, one of our members <coughs> said, you know, such as beamforming, maybe that's a great example of, of how we might even further maximize throughput through the network through the use of AI. So these are again, you know, as Adam said for the first bucket, same thing applies to this one is we could all think of probably 20 more things, but these were some high impact ones that uh, came up and that the group had raised and discussed extensively. So Adam, over to you for the third bucket. Yeah. So, you know, in, in the end, the reason we have networks is because they deliver something of value. Um, and um, I think wittingly or unwittingly, um, uh, I think we're starting to see a regime where more and more applications tend to use a common infrastructure, essentially. So at some point, you're going to have a call on that infrastructure to be able to deliver for the end uses uh, uh, that are important. And um, if you look through those, uh, you have autonomous and connected vehicles. Uh, and it's pretty important to understand that when you look at AI, uh, it isn't just in one place. It causes all kinds of traffic, not always uh, sort of at the functional end of things. Uh, it's one thing to have a control system for a car. It's a very different thing to have a control system for a whole city or a region uh, where traffic flows are. Uh, repair networks, uh, recalls, things of that sort. Uh, and um, if you look at the aspect of AI, which deals with machine learning, things of that sort, the ability to collect data uh, from many, many sources, merge it with other data, uh, causes its own traffic flows, uh, and processes that run all the way from a computing device that may be on a vehicle uh, all the way into the cloud, essentially. Okay? 
and uh, uh, you have scale associated with that. Uh, that scale can be because you're uh, ingesting something that is uh, uh, fairly uh, data intensive, let's say a video, but it may be that you are ingesting lots of small pieces of data, but from millions and millions uh, of things that are out there. Uh, so uh, autonomous and connected vehicles fall in that, cloud, in that uh, uh, category. Uh, if you look at healthcare and healthcare literature, uh, the notions around uh, uh, everything from uh, telemedicine uh, to uh, maintaining people uh, aging in place, things of that sort. Uh, again, lots of implications for traffic uh, and an incredible amount of work being done uh, on AI tools. Uh, if you look at education, uh, again, uh, uh, something very similar there. Uh, if you look at Clayton Christensen, uh, he did a series of articles looking at sort of a revolution in education that's coming because of the use of such tools. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's probably worthwhile looking at. Uh, a lot of it going on in law enforcement. Uh, I would say we've been sort of living through the revolution in consumer services and retail, uh, the rise of Amazon. Uh, the existence of things like Uber, Lyft, and so on. And if you look at their platforms, uh, they're built around AI tools and techniques in a, ver a very, very fundamental way. And then um, if you look at where the largest investment has been in this, it's actually on in the industrial sector, uh, Industry 4.0, you build things like uh, uh, virtual twins, collect stuff from all your machinery all over the world. Uh, and uh, everything from asset management, uh, facilities, inventory control, and optimization of their processes. Okay. Uh, so I, I think, again, it's a small smattering of what's really out there, uh, but uh, I think if you were to look at the world at large and things like uh, uh, IoT, cyber physical systems, uh, uh, anything with similar kinds of labels, uh, you'll probably find around 15 labels out there. Uh, all of them are sort of experimenting with AI tools and very complex processing chains and therefore very complex flow patterns of information on the network. So let me then turn to, uh, to the last one, which is sort of the dark side uh, of, uh, of AI. Um, and the first one is use of AI techniques uh, to compromise security or, uh, or privacy. Uh, replay attacks, DDoS attacks, uh, you know, jamming of various kinds, spoofing, unlawful eavesdropping. Uh, again, if you take a look at what the bad guys are doing, uh, uh, full of use of these kind of tools, essentially. Uh, use of spoofing in many ways. Uh, if you look at uh, most of the cars on the road today, uh, they can actually recognize road signs, speed limits, things of that sort. They'll actually flash them at you. At you. Uh, well, I think people have already found that there are people who go out there and put up false road signs with the wrong speed limits on them. Okay. Okay, so if you ever wanted to close the loop and take the information uh, of what your road signs are telling you, uh, you know, bound for accidents in some ways. Um, the use of facial recognition and bias, uh, we put those two together. Uh, you now have cities that ban the use of it. Uh, you have others who do it on a constant basis. Uh, different parts of the world seem to have different attitudes. Uh, different parts of the U.S. seem to have different attitudes towards this. Uh, again, robocalling. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, the underlying methodologies of uh, looking through all the databases that are out there uh, and uh, figuring out your targets, things of that sort. Uh, again, uh, some fer fairly brilliant, brilliant AI uh, involved in how that's done. Spear phishing, deep fakes, we didn't even do a description of that. Again, these DDoS attacks and uh, the ability to uh, sort of pick up radio signals, eavesdrop on them, and uh, 
uh, detect what may be going on. So uh, quite a bit going on in this space. Lisa? Okay, great. So as we're kind of bringing it, bringing it home here, so a, a lot of use cases there, a lot of uh, good thinking that went into them. We, <coughs> we had uh, quite a extensive set of speakers this past quarter and uh, very, very knowledgeable folks, um, very well known in the industry. We, we learned about markets from our own Mark Bukowski on the team. And then we had Addis, uh, they do have representation on our, our team, but they had a very enlightening paper on the AI-enabled network. So that, that really helped drive us early on in the quarter towards some directions. We, we had Michael Griffiths understanding more about AI on the network and also use in customer service. Bart Selman from Cornell was excellent uh, talking about machine reasoning progress in AI with applications, Yolanda Gill going through the 20-year roadmap, uh, the AI research roadmap, and then uh, Dr. Larry Curran, who also gave us a tutorial on AI. So, uh, uh, it, it might yes. be w w worthwhile adi adding the following. Um, if you look at um, sort of uh, AI as, as a field, uh, there's an association uh, uh, that used CRA, the Computational Research Association, uh, uh, to actually generate a 20-year 20, 20 roadmap for AI. And a lot of that has to do with the things AI doesn't do. You know, the public thinks um, that machines actually think and so on, uh, reasoning, uh, things along those lines. So this is where the field thinks it's going in terms of being able to conquer uh, uh, the challenges that exist. So it's worthwhile looking at that. Uh, there was another strategy roadmap that was put together by uh, uh, actually the administration. Uh, and uh, I think Chuck Romain from uh, NIST actually chaired that. Uh, and it's worthwhile looking both at the CRA roadmap and the NIST uh, uh, and the roadmap that came out of uh, NIDR D uh, to actually sort of get a good feeling for how much investment is going into this area uh, and what the real challenges are. Okay. Great. Thanks, Adam. Those are good points. Um, and then, uh, and lastly, I'm not going to read this very terrible eye chart that I apologize for, um, but we're, we've got several great speakers coming up. Um, one that we, the group is particularly excited about is Paul Tillman to come speak on AI and Spectrum. And um, we are hoping to get that one scheduled um, very soon. We're gonna be hearing about automated automation and the autonomous cars, that's another big topic. And then, uh, you know, several, several others here. I, I included this more just so that we have a record of it and of who else will be coming to speak to us. So, um, you know, with that, we are, you know, that's, that's our findings from, from this time. And I guess we'll open it to any questions. <clears throat> I've got a question. Um, new guy. Yeah, yeah Lisa. Yeah, I should, for the, the new members, our <coughs> protocol is to raise your tent card and, but we will, as our, our, our newest member. Thank you. Yeah, I just <laughs> didn't want to break the protocol. It's good to, Lisa and I spoke over the phone and we've never met in person, so. Um, as I was writing down, and this was probably in the nefarious uh, section, I'd, I'd just taken a note. Um, is there any work or research going on on the inherent bias of the information that goes oh, yeah. in to AI? Yeah. Okay. There, and then, there, you, you'll find in the academic community hundreds of papers coming out every month on that topic. Okay. Okay? A lot of stuff on that. And I think what you're also starting to see uh, is a lot of jurisdictions, political jurisdictions, whether it's cities, states, all of that, legislatures all over looking at all kinds of bills in that area. Okay? Okay, great. Yeah, I just, when I saw it, it was, uh, yeah. The and, list seemed and, to be and a you list know, of it's it's one of those things where where I, I would actually say it's sort of important for the FCC because uh, there are people who want to ban everything. For example, Face ID. Uh, on the other hand, sure gets rid of passwords and an avenue for uh, compromise that happens in other ways. 
and uh, the ability to gather data, in fact, uh, which when collected actually has a lot of value. Okay. So I, I think, you know, uh, I've always heard this from, from Julie, I first do no harm. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think you did once upon a time. I, I think this it is was, why things went. I think it was said before that something about the physicians and. Yeah, it, it, it was. But but I mean, it's it's, it's the point is you got to learn before you figure out what happens, and so I see in a lot of this legislation there is sort of unintended consequences that people may not be aware of. So actually, jawboning, talking about this, flushing that out is fairly important. Yeah, and I, and I would add the bias, it, it, it comes in several ways. It could be bias as in discrimination. It could be bias as in uh, we as humans have preconceived notions of how we think something will end up. And you can introduce bias just by a way you may look at a problem. So there's multiple facets of it. And, and we do need to talk about it. And, and, th that, and in fact, we had a couple of speakers that touched on this as well um, during the preparation for this presentation. Lynn, up next. Yeah, so um, this is a very good presentation as far as uh, bringing this all out to, for all of us. Um, you know, the thing I look at when I, when I see AI and listening to all the description and discussions is, is that it, it's really equally across both the urban and the rural areas as far as what's going to gain and what we're going to see as far as, you know, technology, how it can improve both from, from a city side and a rural side. And I know from a rural side, the, the farming area is going to be huge as far as for that or, or different type of industries <coughs> that are very, very rural. But um, I just think it's great. And hopefully, we'll be able to get someone maybe to give us a little bit more on that as far as in the future, too. Thank you. To totally agree. Because there's, I mean, there's no lack of great applications, especially for, for rural, certainly. John Chapin. Sure. Uh, I attended, and I think some of the others here also attended, a, a recent workshop sponsored by NIDRD um, under the WIZARD group, the Wireless Spectrum Research and Development Group, um, on AI and the wireless spectrum. So first thing, I'd like to encourage the working group to get a copy of that report when it comes out. It should be coming out hopefully sometime this fall. Uh, but I took away three things that I think are particularly relevant that I wanted to bring forward here. First of all, um, within AI, there's many types of AI. The one that's getting a lot of press these days is machine learning. Uh, well, uh, a big topic of discussion at that workshop was the critical importance of labeled data to enable machine learning to tackle any applications. So something to consider is if we can, if you can identify areas that are important to the FCC's mission, the single best thing the FCC could do to stimulate development of AI there is to act as a source or a broker of the <laughs> necessary data. Yeah. And that might be something to consider as a potential yeah. area for the group to, to look create at. Create knowledge graphs and things of that sort that uh, yeah. help you digest, absolutely. But, but certainly the labeled data is critical. Uh, the second thing I took away, um, I just, uh, as you said, there's 20 things that could be on your list of use cases that aren't there. Uh, but the interesting thing about the one that was talked about a lot at the workshop, which was spectrum sharing, is that it falls in the gap between two of your major categories. You had the category of things used by the FCC, and you had the category of things used by the operators. Spectrum sharing is something where the operators aren't using it necessarily to manage their internal networks, but they're using it to comply with something that the FCC is overseeing. So just to make sure that if that is an important application, it doesn't fall into the gap based on the way you've set up the categories. Sure. Yeah. Um, and the third one was that over the course of that discussion at that workshop, just about every, every discussion went from here's a cool thing AI could do for us to yes, but how do we verify, validate, or assure that the AI will work correctly in that application? Um, so if the working group comes across or has the opportunity to hear from experts <coughs> in the area of verifying, validating, and assuring AI, I think that will be a, a very important information to bring forward to the FCC's yeah. attention. Yeah. In fact, I would say Bart Selman talked a little bit about that last point. And I think, again, this is his judgment, that things have gotten to the point where AI greatly improves things, but it has modes of screwing up that are very different from human beings. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Have their own flavor. Yeah. OK? All right. yeah. Thank you. Unintended yeah. consequences, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Thank and you. And those are excellent It's very difficult points. to ask the AI system, why did you say that? Why did you yeah. say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's research on that, too. Yeah. yeah. 
Paul. Thanks, Dennis. So great presentation, guys. Thank you. So three, three quick observations. I'll build on this last point because I think it's the most controversial. So I don't know if the FCC does or should have an opinion on responsible application of AI, which is what you were just pulling upon, but I worry about things like applying the artificial intelligence to make consequential decisions that are service impacting or service yeah. affecting. And then, you know, the, the back end of that whole thing, you know, think of it like the sort of the network equivalent of autonomous trading. You know, should we let networks do that sort of thing? And then the point you were just pulling upon, the explainability afterwards, I mean, when it did it, why did it do it? What did it do? And can anybody even explain explain the results and the consequences? I really think that this is going to be an imperative for the networks, but I really think some transparency is going to be super important, or we're going to be holding our hands trying to figure out what happened and why. Second, an offer. Uh, we've been thinking a lot in Motorola about responsible application of AI. You mentioned public safety. Be happy to offer our thinking around that. It gets to the principles such as human in the loop, um, the explainability point. The, the, you know, the degree of adoption of maturity of the AI, and you mentioned the, the, the data training set. And on the third point, I don't know if you, the FCC is aware, DOD has been doing some things around applying machine learning for spectrum analysis. And so we entered a competition, uh, it was U.S. Army-based competition, they give you a wad of, of essentially unlabeled spectrum data and ask you to say, you know, un analyze it, learn, and, and tell us what it is. And, and so to the extent that you might be able to double up with some of those activities, I think that's going to be increasingly important for what, what you guys need to do as well. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Paul. Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Again, uh, good, good presentation. Uh, AI certainly is, is one of the areas that you mentioned that's on uh, our mind as a service provider. Uh, really four areas we're looking at uh, when it comes to 5G and AI, uh, integrated network planning, traffic optimization, operational automation, and cybersecurity. And I think you've captured each of those in the table. Um, I, I'd certainly like to talk more to the group about some of the work we're doing uh, with our 5G <coughs> planning, uh, 5G traffic distribution, uh, and, and various things that we're using, both AI and machine learning uh, in, in, in 5G and how the two tie together. And maybe this is a joint effort between the two working groups even. Uh, we, we can discuss that. But, um, you know, certainly uh, traffic optimization is one area that we feel uh, is, is, is really uh, ripe for, for machine learning, artificial intelligence. And, and of course, the cybersecurity can under, under stress that as well. Great. Very good. Uh, just one quick comment. Um, All right, Julie. <laughs> No. Wait, there's more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, just that uh, you know, for all the promise and the concerns about the nefarious, it's, it's like um, how do you deal with when things go awry? <laughs> Is there anybody who actually put it together still around that knows how it works? <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, that's also one of the challenges, having uh, – Good records <laughs> to understand because you know you run into something and everybody's going well I don't know why it's doing that and uh, so this is not a reason not to do it it's just you know uh, the challenge as our systems become more complex <laughs> and uh, to some extent a little bit more autonomous <laughs> uh, when something goes awry have we got the materials in place to diagnose what went off the rails. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, Julie, that's an old problem. The systems, oh. the systems now, even if the person is still there, they still don't know how it works or why it works. Julie. No, and that's serious. That that's not a joke. That Julie, is absolutely. Yeah. That is. That is <laughs> yeah. No, that that is the nature of of machine learning based AI. So, all right. Yeah, in, and in fact, it's you know one size fits all in the supplemental materials for the presentation. We've got a taxonomy of of AI. And so uh, d did work a few years ago on rural call completion where, in fact, the type of AI we chose to do the analysis was precisely one that could tell us this is why I've decided this was a carrier acting badly or this is why I think the carrier just was unfortunate. Uh, and, and so that's like part of the thing is, you know, the right tool for the right job and what are the policy requirements to help drive that choice of technology. Very good. Any comments from those on the phone? Hearing none, I'll, I'll just make the observation that 
this is such an exciting area, and I think we're all learning as we move forward in this area. And there's so much there with the, I was particularly noting it with the speakers that the, the group has, has had, and they're outstanding speakers, but it's, it's establishing the baseline to be able <laughs> to move forward. And so that this is one instance where sort of before the fact, the suggestion would be that this group will almost certainly continue for the coming year because there's just so much more to transform the understanding into actionable recommendations. Certainly, I hope that there will be actionable recommendations, but I think there's much more to come in this area. Say I was going to say, if just for Mark, we might want to engage some of our IT folks on some of the ideas that are being talked about and just float them back and forth on how we might build <laughs> Mark's puzzle. The monkey, the monkey just jumped on your back. <laughs> but for, for, for some of the things you talked about for mm -hmm. AI and our systems and, and drawing out information, mm -hmm. I think it would probably be good to have a dialogue with some of our IT people. Yeah, at least get we, the we think so very much. Yeah. Yes. Great. Sure. Yeah. Okay, with that, thank you so much. Right. I, I just want to apologize to the group. I'm going to have to run because we've got a lot of CBRS stuff going on today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want you guys to think I was taking my toys and going home. So. <laughs> and I tried to save a little time for Russ because I bet he has more slides than I do this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for, for those new to the game, this is, there's become a certain competition in this area on length of presentation and number of slides. And <laughs> Very good. Let's move on to, to uh, the UAS, the unmanned aircraft systems, and in this case we have John as the chair, but he is flanked and, and supported from behind by a, yeah. a group that are taking various aspects of the presentation and <coughs> contributing significantly as well. So you can right. introduce the team. As I certainly will. Thank you, Dennis. All right. So uh, <laughs> we have, this is a very broad topic within uh, UAS, uh, communication strategies for UAS. So at present, we're organized into uh, three sub-projects, and so I have three speakers here with me to, organ to represent each of those. Uh, so we've got Stephen Hayes from Ericsson, who will be uh, talking about the work on the s spectrum analysis. At the current stage is the unlicensed, particularly Wi-Fi and Bluetooth technologies. Uh, then next to him is Joe Kramer of the Boeing Company, uh, who will be talking about uh, use of aviation spectrum, spectrum designated for aviation by small UAS. And then I think, Reza, you could come forward when yeah. you get a chance. We have uh, uh, Reza Arefi of, of Intel, um, who will be speaking about the RF analysis tools. Can we get the slides, please? So next slide. No, I've got the command here. All right, here we go. Uh, so here are the, the folks who have been participating. We've had uh, quite uh, broad participation, both with the communications industry and with uh, folks who are uh, experts on the UAS uh, from more from the aeronautical side, <laughs> which has been very productive dialogue there. Um, at the start of our work, which was actually last calendar year, uh, we received a set of priority topics. This is the charge to the group. Um, and uh, at present, we're focusing on just a couple of sub-bullets in here. Uh, the, the utility of various frequency bands uh, for the UAS. Last year's focus was on uh, commercial mobile uh, spectrum, uh, and you'll hear now about some of the early work on the unlicensed spectrum and the technologies that operate there. Uh, a number of these other questions seem to rely on questions about how you do interference analysis uh, within uh, for UAS, uh, which is a relatively new domain, a low altitude aircraft often operating below the roof line of buildings and often communicating to things that are obscured within foliage. Uh, so we have had this effort going on um, RF analysis tools and techniques that supports many of these topics. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the aviation spectrum study. So with that, I will uh, hand it over first to uh, Stephen Hayes uh, for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth description. Oh, I do have one more thing to say while you're getting set up there. Um, you'll see many of these slides have a box in the upper right-hand corner that says pre preliminary. That's deliberate. Uh, the group is right in the middle of its actions right now. And so we chose to uh, show you where we're going uh, with some draft content here. 
but they're marked preliminary so that nobody grabs these slides and run away, runs away with them and says, this is what the tax said about this topic. We're not ready to make that conclusive recommendation yet. We'll be doing that in the December timeframe. So you'll see those preliminary markings. Thank you. Uh, thank you. What I'd like to present here is analysis we're doing in the unlicensed area. And we picked two particular technologies to, to focus on, and those are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And the reason we picked those is because they're actually ones that have been identified as potential candidates for broadcast ID. So uh, using those, we continued the analysis that we started with, the, uh, with cellular and wanted to apply sort of the same analysis to uh, Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, in doing this, you can see we have a lot of question marks there, and we're still discussing sort of what the overall valuation. And part of the reason is because the situation is more complex when you're talking about unlicensed than in uh, licensed bands. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of different functions that communication uh, is needed for in a, a drone. And unlike cellular where you can more or less control the environment and uh, ensure that things work, you don't have as much control over the, uh, the communications reliability or, or capabilities in an unlicensed environment. In some cases, you will be able to control the environment and license can still work. But in other cases, such as, for example, uh, separation assurance where you want to have cooperative communications to avoid collision or broadcast ID, um, you're going to have to be able to use technologies that work in all environments. Um, you, you don't want to just avoid collisions and uh, favorable environments. So uh, taking that in consideration, one of the things that you'll see a little bit later is that there's a need to, for a license, to separate the analysis into those environments, for example, where you can control the amount of interference, such as uh, maybe industrial areas where you have control or very rural areas uh, where you're not expecting a license, and urban and suburban areas where you could encounter a lot of environments that could uh, reflect on safety. Okay. Uh, my eyes aren't good enough to read, so I need to advance here. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that we did have difficulties finding uh, actual uh, quantitative literature, so most of this analysis is somewhat qualitative. And we didn't want to endorse a particular system. We just wanted to sort of describe how we expected it to work. We looked at various characteristics, such as the availability, capacity, coverage, security, uh, how well it integrates across the different communication functions, latency, deployment issues, and cost. Uh, there's some things we didn't look at that uh, uh, are related particularly to safety such as the size of the UAV and the air traffic zone, because we didn't actually feel that this would uh, directly affect the radio analysis, even though they would very much affect the, the safety analysis. We also looked, uh, and this is from the previous analysis we did, at different sort of communication zones, and this is important in the unlicensed environment. Uh, one of them was above 400 feet, and there's where we expect to have larger UAVs with more significant payloads and the, uh, the risk of collisions either the air or uh, damage if it uh, falls out of the sky are, are higher because they're larger. We also have the 400, uh, below 400 foot sort of nearby line of sight, and this is actually an area where unlicensed uh, does quite well. But the one I think that we really concentrated on was the beyond visual line of sight, where it was below 400 feet and uh, not in a visual line of sight. And these are, is an area where a license can work in some areas, but in many cases it will struggle. Okay, so some of the assumptions we made. 
Uh, we assumed uh, Wi-Fi 5 and 6, also called 11AC and AX. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about scenarios. And the scenarios, uh, some of them assume that there are Wi-Fi networks. And when we assume that the existence of a Wi-Fi network, we sort of assume that these were managed networks uh, conforming to Wi-Fi Alliance certifications. We looked at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, we assume directional antennas to give the best uh, connectivity. As I mentioned earlier, we had some difficulties in finding quantitative data. And the, as you know, when it's unlicensed, you aren't getting much in the way of guarantees or, or protection. The scenarios we looked at. Okay, at the low end, you have sort of these very inexpensive drones where you don't even have a console. You're just using your, an app on your phone and using the Wi-Fi. And we didn't consider that those were a significant case of commercial deployment. There might be some commercial deployments that you could, or commercial cases you could use it for, but it's, it's primarily a toy. So once we looked at were, were two cases. One was where you had a, uh, an operator with an extended antenna, or a console with an extended antenna. Uh, they might be getting video feedback from the device, but this could be used in best cases to give a beyond visual line of sight of up to 10 kilometers. The other one we looked at is we actually had a network, and here we assumed, as I mentioned earlier, the carrier grade networks. Uh, the problem with these is that uh, you tend to see these, for example, in hotels or uh, uh, malls or airports, but you don't see really many of them deployed outdoors where you expect to fly the drones. Okay, so here is an example of the analysis we did. This is just for the command and control You'll later, not including this in the first part of the slides. In the backup slides, you can find some for the other cases, but we looked at the Wi Fi. And it, it does, in many cases, support 10 kilometers, but you may not get that in an urban area. And you typically use 2.4 gigahertz for the longer range. And then in standalone and network scenarios, you can see different environments. Uh, for the standalone, uh, it's going to be severely reduced in urban areas. You don't have the ability to provide different quality of service levels. And you don't necessarily get internet connectivity, which is something you would need in order to, for example, provide uh, flow of information back to the UTM. In network, it, it's more capable. Um, and then the question becomes uh, how widely it's deployed. But if you have a network solution, they can improve congestion handling, even though you cannot eliminate an unlicensed band. And this is, um, sorry. Uh, this table then shows sort of a checkbox type analysis. Uh, you see some brackets where we've described the uh, difference in the scenario between uh, urban and rural environments, for example, or various conditions. <laughs> so again, when you do the unlicensed analysis, you end up sort of having to segregate it based on the uh, conditions that you're expecting to uh, encounter. And then we did the same thing for Bluetooth. Um, in, in this, uh, we uh, again, we ignored the sort of Bluetooth app on the phone. Uh, and instead of a access point network, you'd probably have a mesh network set up. Again, it's not clear that this is really deployed anywhere, uh, but, but that's the network configuration we looked at. And to shorten the analysis here, uh, since Bluetooth is really a personal area network, it's really worse at just about everything that you would need for a UAV than, than Wi-Fi is. So uh, anything, any of the deficiencies we found for a Wi-Fi uh, are even increased when you talk about using the Bluetooth technology. And uh, that is the end of 
my part will be continuing to do the analysis and hopefully we can fill in some of those question marks. Thank you. And uh, next is uh, Reza who will talk about the RF analysis tools and methods. Um, you Thank you. Thank <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, this <coughs> next section, um, RF analysis tools and methods, is uh, basically to address um, part of the, the scope of, of the working group, which is related to, um, if I want to put it in, in, in very briefly, it's related to the, what I call the, the problem with the allocation. Um, as you know, UAVs fall under the mobile service. Mobile service has a subcategory of aeronautical mobile, mobile service. Um, in the ITU, the mobile <laughs> service by default includes aeronautical, but whether domestically, whether the rules need to allow, specifically allow aeronautical operation, that's, that's basically under, under debate. Um, la in, as part of last year's output of, of the working group, um, we did make a suggestion that probably at least some category of of UAVs could be considered as part of the um, extension of the land mobile that would simplify things, understanding that that wouldn't be applicable to, to all categories of, of UAVs, of course. Um, but we would like to, this year, we would like to um, present some supporting material for, um, for making progress towards that goal of um, coming to a, to a um, sort of a conclusion, maybe helping the FCC with uh, making progress in, the, in that in that front, if if we can. Uh, we know that the um, if there isn't uh, aeronautical prohibition on a mobile service ban, there's a reason for it, and uh, and so all the, the the incumbent services that shouldn't be affected, of course, uh, need to be considered in that. Uh, in that in that analysis, we're trying to help with the the, uh, the appropriate kind of analysis that that would lead to um, analyzing whether that prohibition can, could still happen uh, be be kept in place or or at least for some um, types of UAVs be waived. The um, just one for going to through the rest of the slide, just one piece of news maybe maybe you have heard there's there's a uh, CEPT proposal to WRC 19 for an agenda, agenda item um, for WRC 23 to remove aeronautical prohibition for certain bands below one gigahertz uh, there's a proposal from APT uh, to allow um, uh, aeronautical platforms as as base stations up to below three gigahertz, so the discussions are are happening, and it's it's good to to think about the the consequences and the best way of, of addressing this. Um, so when we look at the um, within the within the U.S. table of allocation, we look at certain mobile broadband um, spectrum bands. Uh, that you that, that you see here on the table. This is from this, this is uh, the table is from our last year's uh, output of the group. Um, these are the bands that, uh, in in terms of allocation, have the the except aeronautical mobile restriction on them, either entirely or part part of the band. And um, and you can see there's a there's a quite a variety from. Below one gigahertz, below one, all the way to millimeter wave. You see this this issue. Um, generally, when you look at this, there are co-primary either aeronautical services or space services. 
uh, in the band or in the adjacent band, and that could be part of it. Uh, in some cases, you have s s uh, some sensitive federal systems, such as radars, for instance, and again, in the band or in adjacent band, uh, or, or uh, same area uh, fixed service use, uh, sometimes used by public safety or utilities that are also sensitive. And, and therefore would, uh, would require that kind of pr uh, protection. However, you see that there's a, the big point is there's a variety of cases in terms of spectrum and, and uh, in incumbents. Um, so it, it seems like a, a, uh, a single analysis for everything is, is out of the question, out of the picture, of course. These are all different. They have different uh, characteristics and different incumbents, different protection criteria, et cetera. Um, extent of use is different, um, different co-primary services. Um, their coordination mechanisms are, could, could vary. Uh, the, it's, it, it would be a simplistic thing that one, one coordination mechanism would work for all of those incumbents. Um, and the adjacent allocations also vary. So we would like to propose a, a, a general an approach that produces general, general guidelines um, on a quantitative analysis that could apply to, to many bands, cust be customized to, to, to each and every band that, that would be considered. Um, we, we would like to, uh, we need to characterize the propagation environment. Uh, we need to characterize the, um, the types of the UAVs. Um, some of them are small, some of them are large, apply at different altitude that creates different uh, operational environment, of course. Um, in some cases, you could have aggregate effects. In some cases, maybe not. So that, that, that's something to consider. Um, and also, the, the nature of uh, the risk of uh, interference risk, um, uh, particularly when we deal with uh, certain aeronautical and, and um, sensitive uses. So in this, this uh, these are the two major elements of this quantitative analytical approach. Um, we, th we think that both aspects need to be looked at and not in a, in a vacuum. Of course, a sharing and compatibility study is essential, but it also needs to, the sharing and compatibility study needs to take into account the, the system design of the UAV, because that's what tells us what the characteristics are, what the usages, usage scenarios are, uh, what kind of deployment scenario the UAV would be uh, would be um, uh, would be deployed in, and that would be very different from small UAVs versus larger ones. Um, the the and in doing these, of course, we need to um, look at the um, um, analytical tools that could be used to do this. The prop appropriate propagation models could be used. In the group, we looked at a generalized um, deployment uh, scenario for, for UAVs, depending on whether they are, um, depending on their altitude, whether, uh, whether the connections are, are UAV, to UAV to UAV or UAV to infrastructure or UAV to an operator. And so you would be, whether you are, both ends are inside the clutter, one end is outside the clutter, or both are outside the clutter. All of these determine what kind of propagation environment we deal with. And that, that is something that um, is, is essential in doing the right kind of analysis. Um, the, the, the link budget would, for instance, um, is important to, because it, it, would, it would give us the, the right kind of system parameters for, for the UAV to consider. Um, of course, measurements and monitoring data, if, if there are information like that, is, is, is very good. But in the absence of that, we could, we could of course, do theoretical studies. And, and we would need all, all that kind of um, system design information from the UAVs for that purpose as well. And the, the, and the last bullet was, uh, was the main point here, that both of these elements need to be considered at the same time. In res with respect to each other and not um, looking at only sharing uh, analysis without the 
uh, consideration of the, the system and network parameters that under which the UVs operate um, would not be very uh, informative. So we would like to, well, first of all, we would like to, as much as we can, refine and expand that list of bands, the table that, we, that you saw, collect more information about the incumbent systems and their requirements, and uh, pick a sample band and um, expand the methodology for that, um, for, that, for that band. Consider, for instance, a likely UAV deployment scenario. Uh, it could be, for instance, a package delivery right, in an urban area. That's one, one example. Right? Pick that and, uh, and then look at the, um, the operation environment for that and the kind of uh, characteristics and system parameters that that kind of UAV would have list all of those, um, look at the incumbent systems uh, in that band or in the adjacent band and what their characteristics are, and, and propose a methodology that would consider all of these elements with the right kind of propagation. And we have started looking at various propagation models, um, mostly ITU propagation models, but we're open to all of the other ones as well that would be suitable for this kind of study. And then we, we would try to l determine and list all the, the study elements, including propagation models and parameters that would enable industry, FCC, and, and, and all stakeholders to perform detailed um, analysis and simulations uh, for a, uh, a more concrete answer. Um, we understand that in the, in the working group, we're not in a position to, to to do this kind of detailed study ourselves, uh, the, the, the simulations our, ourselves. I mean, even, even if we do, it would be only for, for a single band, and I mean, it cannot be extended to others. But so, so we're going with this general methodology approach to make sure that at least on the methodology, we can agree that this is the kind of methodology to follow that could be applied to, to all bands. And uh, that's where we are so far. Thank you. This over then to, uh, to Kramer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Joe Kramer from Boeing, and this is my first TAC, uh, much like Vince, and I appreciate you all having, having me here. Usually I sit in the back row watching. So um, uh, I fortunately was asked to help lead the um, analysis of aviation spectrum work, and um, the work in, in our group focused on the small UASs, and I hope eventually we move to larger ones. But right now, the, the, the work in our group is looking at aviation spectrum bands for small UASs. Um, I do, would like to mention that, the, um, that AI, I think, will play a critical role in larger UAS applications and, and functionality, especially when it gets deployed in the national <laughs> airspace. So I really think it's critical that maybe we try to keep that in mind um, as, we, as we move forward. I definitely think there are a lot of benefits to AI in, um, in the larger UAVs. So let me go to the next slide. So we were, again, asked to um, consider spectrum designated for um, aviation use, and we thought first it would be helpful to maybe put on the slide deck, you know, what are the regulatory kind of definitions at a simpler level for aeronautical. Um, at the FCC, the, um, the terrestrial aviation is regulated under Part 87. Not many people, you know, follow that part. Um, I live there. <laughs> and, part, <laughs> sad, and part 25 with respect to the satellite um, component. And uh, satellite plays a critical role in providing connectivity to aircraft, especially the larger ones. So we, we want to, and I would like to include and make sure that the aeronautical mobile satellite service and AMS is also thought of in our group. And we will look at that as we move towards December. Um, so in addition, because we're considering uh, mostly small UASs in our group here, there's a lot of aviation bands. 
uh, we could go into like nine kilohertz. So we thought realistically putting boundaries on it, we would start at the VHF communications band uh, where antenna size and, and form factor is probably more applicable to a small UAS than a you know, HF antenna. So, and we also were told or asked to keep it at a maximum limit of about six gigahertz. And the highest aviation band is 5650. So we stopped there. Um, or that's where we will stop. Of course, if the TAC would like us to go above and below, we're happy to do that. But uh, December will be here really quick, and I'll be at the WRC. So I hope you all don't ask too much more of us. Go to the next slide. Uh, not a lot to talk about on here. We didn't get to potential benefits yet uh, in our group. So I don't have any for you right here to talk about. However, we did talk about uh, some of the potential barriers, uh, especially for, and again, as Riza was mentioning, small UASs. We're not talking about the big ones. So because at first, if you're using aviation safety spectrum, there's another important federal agency that's intimately involved in this, and that's the FAA. And the FAA has technical standards orders and rules and regulations with respect to using aviation spectrum. Um, so we want to make sure that that is at least made aware of to this group that it's not just the FCC um, that impacts it. In addition, there's a cost if you deal with the FAA and getting the safety and reliability requirements met that FAA uh, will require you in order to utilize, well, you know, FAA spectrum, let's say. And that cost could be a detriment or a barrier to the small UASs accessing, you know, the spectrum. Now, for larger ones, there'll be more safety systems uh, uh, imposed, most likely, well, probably definitely, and, uh, and those systems and the costs associated with them would be just considered to be part of uh, doing business. In addition, when you have more avionics requirements in using uh, the FAA spectrum, well, you're gonna add weight, probably. And uh, the size of the avionics take away, or could take away, your functionality of the small UAS. Um, let's, for example, you know, we have a product called Scan Eagle. it's about 55 pounds. When the FAA tells us you have to put ADSB on this product in order to fly it, well, that takes away, that adds weight and takes away uh, capability in terms of fuel and distance. So there are some disadvantages in using uh, the aviation bands because of the requirements. Um, we put in here congestion as another example of a potential uh, barrier. Um, the volume of small UASs would far exceed the volume of large UASs and also uh, commercial aircraft that, that would share the spectrum. Uh, we don't have it quantified, but uh, in general, we think it would add to the congestion and probably add to the uh, challenges in, uh, in having safe and secure and reliable access to the aviation spectrum. And of course, you know, aviation spectrum, frankly, I think this could be a, a positive and a barrier, is the protection levels, where the protection levels add, um, they're, some, they're very stringent. And so you would have to uh, make your equipment, well, and let me put an analogy. There is nothing that you can buy at Best Buy that satisfies um, <laughs> RTCA and FAA requirements. There is an exponential level of cost and and detail and involvement with, for everything you put on an airplane. They're not cheap, and I can attest to that, although I won't give you any details. So, oops, sorry, moving to the, my last slide. Uh, so, again, next step, we hope to refine our, our analysis and of the barriers and add the, um, the benefits, and there are some, we just haven't had them put them in for this. Uh, we think there's some impact. We also would like to add more of the unlicensed, shared, and exclusive um, requirements that, that have been asked of us, and we'll put those in for the December meeting, and maybe even add some more context for you that I kind of ad libbed here while I'm talking to you. Um, again, and also uh, the applicability 
of different UAS uses and sizes. Small UAS is where we're focusing now because that's what, we, what was asked of us. But you know, if you think about it, a 55 pound UAV falling from 400 feet will hurt you pretty bad. So yeah. um, <laughs> small is relative and so um, maybe throwing in some additional uh, uses we thought would be beneficial to the tech in that aspect. So next I go back to Stephen. No, we, we're not nope. Gonna, nope. Okay. We're not going to take the time on the backup slides mm. for right now. So Good. that's all of the briefings for now. Thank you very much to the, the project, sub-project leads here <clears throat> and I think we are ready for questions. So uh, broad broad scope of coverage. Are there questions? Tom, you're first up. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the good work, and I think it's um, really insightful. Um, just wanted to ask if the working group, I think, Rezo, in the work you're, you're doing, are you able to leverage some of the existing uh, studies on from the ITU models and so forth on simulation propagation? Yes, yeah, certainly, yes. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, that was short and sweet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, in terms of methodologies, in terms of propagation models, we, we, uh, we, at least my, my instinct is to, to go with, uh, with ITU approved models and methods. Great. I think that'll be helpful to help, uh, you know, keep, to, keep the work moving along and to help reach some conclusions about the, uh, the efficacy of this. So, thank you. <coughs> Dale. I have a question that's a little bit uh, tangential, but my impression is, and you're sitting next to Greg here, about the noise level at mm -hmm. some of these lower frequencies ke keeps going up, and uh, I, I wonder, uh, I wonder how you're going to think about that in terms of the are these bands inhabitable. Uh, given the LED devices and other things that out there are generating an, an awful lot, of, awful lot of noise, I was—I don't know whether you've made any measurements down there that would help uh, inform that or not. But it's, it's a general—I think it's a general concern. But now you're talking in that below 108 or something. Now you're really where I think we're seeing a lot of those noise problems. Yeah, if I could, <laughs> um, I know in VHF com bands they're receiving LED interference at airports. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, Aviation Spectrum Resources, ASRI and the airlines and the airports have, are working on, on a case-by-case -case basis mostly, trying to, trying to resolve it. I think we should definitely keep that in mind, especially in VHF. I'm not aware of LED issues up in the four, five, six gigahertz, but they're, I'm just not aware of it. Well, I, uh won't get on a soapbox here, <laughs> but <laughs> it sure be nice if people were making routine noise measurements as we have talked about in the TAC before, so we would know is the problem getting better or worse, and what are the sources of the, uh, that are causing the increasing noise levels. Know me. Yeah, so maybe just a follow-up question. First, great, great presentation by all of you. Interesting you say that about LED. I just heard about a company recently that offers like, it's almost like a, a broad, a wireless, they don't call it wireless, but a broadband service over LED. Over LED. <laughs> it's called Li-Fi, I know. So that makes it even scarier what you just said. Um, I was just wondering just if you could say a little bit more about the study, kind of following up on, um, on Dale's question. I know you said it would be a single band, but how, 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 a little bit more about how, how would we, do something like that, and would it be in one geography? And what, what do you see collecting? Or um, yes, basically, it's the, the the main idea is to develop the methodology, right? The general methodology to follow. Um, but we can't stay too general. We need to um, we need to focus on on a single band so we can uh, uh, get to the next step, which is okay. What's the what are the potential deployment models for this kind of band, whether it's low band or high band, it would be different. Um, uh, so we, we have not picked a band yet, but, uh, uh, but, but maybe um, given what I just said about uh, CPT proposal WRC, maybe, maybe the cellular band is, is, a, um, is, is, a, is a good candidate to look at um, uh, the situation there 
with the incumbents, what are the issues, and try to develop a methodology to address um, the, um, not, not to address, to, for, for those who want to do the actual simulations, um, have something to go by. What are the elements that they need to look at? Um, uh, the, the whole <clears throat> sorry, the, the, the idea is for, for people not to forget that a um, looking at a um, complex sharing scenario like this can be done by just one line calculation. Right. Um, I was, I was wondering, like, how would the actual collection be done? Would you be using the kinds of tools that the FCC Enforcement Bureau has, or how would we do it? Mm -hmm. uh, n n no. Um, mm -hmm. It would be basically guidelines for, a, for putting together a study, right? Um, looking at the parameters of a typical or a potential UAV use in, a, in, a, in the band. Um, what kind of um, densities, what kind of deployment environment, whether it would be urban, suburban, rural, um, looking at um, the, um, the operational environment, power levels, um, the other kinds of requirements, antenna, et cetera, um, and basically put those next to the, all the characteristics of the incumbents of of, of the band, um, what kind of protection requirements they need, what kind of, uh, whether they are spread in large geographic areas, whether they are in a, um, limited to a specific sites. Um, all these would help us come up with a, um, with a method to, to do, for, for those of us who want to actually do the study, to do, to, to do the simulations. <laughs> Um, what kind of propagation models for each of those scenarios are, are the good ones to use? Um, uh, for instance, if, if the operational environment is an urban area, what are the propagation models applicable to the urban area for line of sight, non line of sight situations that, that could be used? What are the, um, <coughs> the points of strength and weakness of each of those models? What, what can we expect? Um, um, if, if the band, for instance, has um, uh, incumbents that are aeronautical or space services, what kind of propagation models for those kind of links we should be using? Um, um, and um, yeah, so we, we, we're still putting this together, but this is basically, um, this okay. is basically the, the idea. I don't know if I Thanks. answered Thanks. your question. Thanks, thank you. Not. Marvin. Uh, I know that the FAA has uh, issued a number of uh, exemptions uh, for beyond visual light of sight operations to uh, uh, different firms such as uh, Google's uh, Wing package delivery service and Amazon has a similar petition pending. Uh, their proposed to operate at distances of 20 kilometers, uh, which is beyond the range you said could be used for unlicensed, and none of the cellular frequencies seem to be applicable because they're all restricted, what are these services using? I guess we'll ask our group members who come from that community. <laughs> it's a good question. So you stumped the panel, it sounds. <laughs> it's a secret. Yeah. 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 So. It should be in their FCC license application to transmit, right? So. What kind of license? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Marvin, you've done well in your professorial role. <laughs> Greg. <laughs> As we come down the row here, you're going to be hearing about how the trending is towards smaller and smaller cells. So if a, um, a UAV obviously would need a bigger and bigger cell. So how have you thought about any? Thing about how the two would coexist. Okay, I I think you're talking here about a a cellular environment. Then, yeah, so I noticed that on your list. Uh, yeah, that was last year's focus. Yeah. 
Typically, they, uh, they're microcells and macrocells, and I think it would depend on sort of the quality of service that you need and what the characteristics are. Uh, so, for example, you might have the payload <coughs> over a smaller cell because uh, uh, you need the higher capacity but you're more tolerant of errors. The command and control channel might be using lower frequency at an overlay cell. Uh, but I think it's going to depend, if you're using, for example, 3GPP technology, the system is going to be using its normal algorithms for figuring out which frequency to, to provide that particular service on. I, I don't know if that's answering, yeah, answering it does. a good question. Um, I was just trying to think of the guy who's flying the drone over the football stadium yeah. um, when everybody is on their phone taking pictures and, and talking. Yeah. I, the thing I'd like to point out uh, that, as I mentioned, there are different environments. So over a football field where you have 40,000 people, a uh, sailor will probably, a sailor should work because it's network controlled and it can. Uh, allocate the resources to particular devices. Unlicensed probably won't. But uh, as mentioned, if you're doing, if you have a pipeline in Alaska that you want to do a inspection of, then you could very well string access points along that, and it would probably provide you good enough service uh, in unlicensed because there's no uh, real interference going on. So again. Uh, it's going to depend on the scenario as to what uh, works best. Thank you. Thank you. And prioritization Greg? is important in this context, too, because you give it the highest priority. You yes. Can yeah. Sure. Always and, gets access. And the only other thing to note, Greg, in our study last year of the potential use of uh, the cellular mobile frequency bands, uh, we noted there were several proposals to have distinct antennas. So an operator that chose to try to deliberately um, make a business out of supporting UAS might put sky-facing antennas um, and give them um, perhaps different cell sizes than the down-tilted antennas that provide the terrestrial service. Yes, that's interesting. Steve? Maybe one, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, we have, we have one more comment from a group member oh, okay. here. Oh, very quickly, yeah. um, related to small cells that you mentioned, um, do you know, as, as you, as the, the equipment, like it, on, on a UAV, as it becomes elevated, it immediately gets line of sight to many base stations, so it doesn't necessarily have to connect to the base station that's closest. So that's also, the geometry up there is quite different. Thanks. Yeah. Steve? Uh, uh, yes, uh, a couple things. One, one uh, I start with just an apology to my group members. I'm a member of this group and should have probably gotten some of these <laughs> comments in before this thing was produced. But um, in the previous year, um, I brought, uh, we had a presentation on capacity, um, and uh, we declined to say too much about it because it was only from one vendor. Um, however, I would want to remind everybody that um, high capacity throughput in secured channels is currently out in production for other use cases and that numbers were brought to bear, so we should be probably revisiting those and possibly looking at the studies that are out there and use cases that are out there for capacity so that we can say things that are more concrete. Um, and uh, I, Paul was uh, reminding me that there, were, there are studies out there um, as well, and so we should probably be looking at those. This isn't quite as green, as greenfield a study area as I feel like this presentation is, is showing. Thank you, and we'll look forward to additional studies brought forward by Paul. That would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there, there, those additional studies have been around for a while. Uh, different entities, including some represented around this yeah. table, have been uh, studying this question for quite a while, and so yes. just so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's uh, why, if you could point us to the ones that you think are most relevant, that's okay. what I was asking to be sure. helpful. Happy yes. to do it. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Also happy to point you to the Amazon petition uh, at the FAA that was mentioned earlier. So. Mm -hmm. Julie, I'm on the last one. Um, 
first of all, ter terrific work. Uh, glad that you've been looking at all the different things. Uh, that said, on the commercial side, you might think about trying to narrow <laughs> the problem a little bit rather than all of the commercial bands. And, and, and one way to think about it is, first of all, for, for the characteristics that were discussed about operationally, the size of antennas and so forth, which you know, came up in the context of the sharing, also apply here. You know, I've got to put this thing on there. I can't have a massive antenna on it. Uh, but there are, there are some things that I think of you can head off battles before they occur, where particularly, I'm thinking of it, some of these bands are adjacent to aeronautical. <laughs> And the, the problem that you've got in the analysis is that the, the UAS could be anywhere. <laughs> you know, so before maybe there was an out-of-band emissions limit that was set based on an assumed separation of some distance, but I can already anticipate what the pushback would be. Well, how will I know it'll be? It could be flying right next to me. <laughs> so you might want to take a look at some of the bands that uh, you've got on there in and narrow it to here are the things we think are make the most sense to look at from from both sides of that, that equation. On the Wi-Fi side, I mean, one of the things that, and I don't know if you can get this information or not, uh, you know, the stories of I, I, and, and there's so many different UAS, you know, from the from the twenty-five dollar toy, <laughs> which is not going to have any sophisticated electronics in it, uh, to like then. Whether you call it a hobbyist, I spent a thousand dollars on my UAS. It flew off and it never came back. <laughs> How many of them? I'd just be curious if you have any sense at all. Have got homing capability? Because <laughs> uh, it always makes me a little nervous. Uh, e even people acting with good intentions, doing terrific things, and it flew off. And okay, where did it land? <laughs> And, uh, Other than the one that came in Julie's backyard. Uh, it's not my backyard I'm worried about. It's the school. <laughs> uh, you know, just having a little bit more insight, which is not to suggest that, you know, people, you know, we've got a lot of folks doing stuff with Wi-Fi right now and so forth, but to have a better understanding, if we're, we're going to do something that says, hey, we need this other space, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? <laughs> so. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. For those on the phone, any questions from you all? Hearing none, we have concluded the morning. I, too, would like to thank the group for the, the good work. I know there's been a flurry of activity here at the end, too, to put some of the things together. But it's good, good work covering the, the area. And as, as always, lots more to do as well. We have lunch. Hmm? Oh, Marty, go ahead. before lunch. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to make a comment about uh, what you said, Julie, uh, about uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Because it's fundamental to artificial intelligence that any artificial intelligence system will learn. Yeah. It is much easier to teach, to create an artificial intelligence system that learns than it is to constrain how much it learns. And so, uh, it is certain that the artificial intelligence systems that we create will learn things that we neither intended nor expect. And at some point, and I think that point is pretty close to the future, it will learn things that we're incapable of even understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you've identified a really uh, profound and serious problem. Yeah, it, it's the ones that don't learn so well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, independent of the, the notion of wasting the time <laughs> and, uh, and redeeming the time, maybe, I, I think we will break. The, the food is there. Again, thanks to Brian and CTA for providing our meal um, and, and not wishing to lose the, the, the valuable time, as Marty suggests. I think we'll come back together at quarter till one as opposed to one o'clock. <laughs> It'll allow a few people maybe to catch planes with a little more flexibility <laughs> than they otherwise might have. So with that, um, please also do greet our new members. And, and Joe, it's good to have you with us as well. Um, so 
We'll see you all back in an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. They cleared out? Yeah, just for you. Yeah. I now announced it was time to reassemble and everybody ran for a cookie. <laughs> I think a bunch of people made a terrible mistake. They checked their email. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do that. So I'm good yeah, it does. I knew that would be a disaster. All right. Greg and Marty are ready. <coughs> Yep. Mm. And it is 12.45, so we are, in fact, starting 15 minutes early. Let that be a point of awareness for the remaining two working group commi <laughs> committees, that we are, in fact, starting early. So if we start, if we end late, uh, we will. <laughs> Yeah, okay, all right. So when you are ready, I think we're ready to go. The antenna working group, Greg and Marty. Yeah, we, we are the antenna systems technology working group, just to correct that, uh, the first chart. Uh, we started out uh, last year being the antenna working group and uh, decided that our uh, the definition of uh, antenna was just too simple because uh, we, we all know that an antenna is nothing more than a transducer from uh, electromagnetic energy in, in the form of current to uh, radiated uh, energy and it turns out antennas are a lot more complicated than that. They're fixing it for us. Demonstrating the responsiveness of the team. Yeah, good, I appreciate that. <laughs> So uh, uh, we discovered that there are lots and lots of variations of, of passive antennas, uh, but uh, but this before we I, of course, uh, uh, Greg and I chair this group. Uh, uh, the uh, members of the group we can show on the uh, next slide if you could click that on. We should mention our liaisons are yeah are yeah we are uh, liaison by. Uh, uh, Martin does that uh, by uh, Michael and uh, several other members of the staff, and they've been very supportive, as always. And uh, I'm sure you can read every single one of the members of the group who have also <laughs> been very supportive. So uh, we, uh, we were tasked with looking at uh, uh, new technology. Uh, there is not much new uh, for in passive antennas, primarily uh, because they're all pretty well defined. Uh, 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 Adam uh, discovered a site where they had a characterization of 350 different kinds of passive antennas, all of which did essentially the same thing. And uh, the relevant thing for the commission is that the uh, existing rules pretty much cover how to regulate those antennas. We had discovered, however, uh, in listening to uh, the uh, uh, numerous lectures that we have, uh, that uh, dynamic antennas do a great deal more than passive antennas. And we have come to the conclusion, uh, which we could discuss uh, further later, uh, that all those 350 antennas that Adam uh, hooked me up with are, are all obsolete because, <laughs> because for in systems that we mostly deal with, 
namely point-to-point -point, uh, communications system where uh, capacity uh, and performance are important with those constraints, uh, dynamic antennas may and, and uh, uh, very possibly uh, always do perform better, have better capacity, and cost less than a passive antenna, <coughs> which leads you to wonder why anybody would use, in, in a significant system, would ever use a passive antenna today. Uh, and if you look at outside of the cellular industry, that happens to be the case. You don't know uh, hardly any uh, uh, Wi-Fi access points that don't use uh, uh, dynamic antennas. Uh, and there are many other kinds of systems. Somehow or other, uh, in uh, the uh, cellular industry, uh, we're still using passive antennas. Uh, we are now focused on 5G, and in 5G, uh, when we use millimeter waves, you pretty much have to use dynamic antennas. So the question now uh, that we uh, bring up is, first of all, how do we regulate these dynamic antennas? Uh, and uh, that problem hasn't been uh, resolved yet, uh, as we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, and the second thing is the, we question the prioritization of uh, uh, putting enormous efforts into millimeter wave technology when there are, whether it is uh, unlikely that a large percentage of the population will ever avail themselves of millimeter wave technology. Uh, and when you combine this with the problems that we've got uh, with the digital divide, which is a lot more than just rural areas, the di digital divide affects us uh, uh, not only with regard to coverage, but uh, very much with regard to cost. Uh, and uh, uh, millimeter waves uh, have no impact there. And so one of the uh, areas of interest that we've come on is this question of the prioritization of uh, the use of uh, dynamic antenna technology in millimeter waves in contrast with all of the other bands. You wonder why we don't use uh, more dynamic antennas at lower frequencies and whether that would increase capacity more in the lower frequencies so there wouldn't be this constant uh, demand for more spectrum. So uh, we have come up with some, uh, with some uh, 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 recommendations to the commission uh, based upon those things that I'll cover those when we get to, to, to the end. So uh, uh, the only uh, aspect that I, on this slide that I think is, is uh, worth uh, pursuing, you can read the rest of it, uh, is that uh, there is no doubt that sharing is going to become more and more important. And a, a very unique thing that occurs when you use the most advanced kinds of dynamic antennas, if you in fact have the capability of transmitting directly from a transmitter to the uh, uh, individual or device uh, that you're transmitting to and avoiding transmitting to any other places, especially where other people are trying to transmit, you know, all of a sudden you realize that the whole concept of cellular communications uh, disappears. The whole concept of allocating spectrum disappears. So uh, there are some profound things that can happen in the future uh, that will happen as we develop uh, these uh, dynamic uh, antennas. And Julie will have nothing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Yeah, and, you can finally retire. That's, that's okay. <laughs> and, Julie, and Julie will personally have nothing to do anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> it turns out that uh, uh, Julie's not off the hook. <laughs> because we don't, we have the biggest idea, I'm concluding, by the way, uh, uh, some of our speakers think they've solved the problem. Uh, we have no idea how to regulate the most advanced kinds of, of uh, antennas. How can you regulate something that is constantly changing in every respect? It's moving around constantly. It's going up and down uh, totally unpredictably. And now uh, Julie and his staff got to figure out how to, how to manage that. Uh, and uh, the proposals that are, are on the table uh, really uh, don't seem to be working. 
Uh, we have some groups who have uh, stated that total radiated power is the way to solve it. It turns out that for some forms of dynamic antennas that works, other forms it doesn't. There is not universal acceptance of, of even that uh, uh, concept of, uh, of regulating uh, uh, dynamic antennas. So uh, the question that comes up is this issue of uh, uh, are our priorities uh, appropriate? <coughs> I, I already mentioned the fact that that uh, dynamic antennas uh, uh, properly uh, deployed will not only perform better, have higher efficiency, uh, have higher capacity, but they will almost always cost less. And the reason you get uh, lower cost is because you increase capacity, and if in fact your systems are capacity constrained, uh, they will end up being much more uh, cost effective. We have a uh, difficulty that has come up uh, that we've discovered uh, in, uh, with our various speakers that when you start getting into the contentious areas about what kind of technology to use, people are talking past each other. They, they use technology terms uh, in very different ways. And uh, it has uh, turned out to be a, a, a major problem in trying to get a conversation going where we end up with a common solution. One example being uh, the term beamforming, uh, uh, which has a, really a very specific meaning, although people tend to generalize. Uh, and it turns out that uh, beamforming uh, is the way that you, the only way that you really works well uh, at millimeter wave frequencies. It turns out at lower frequencies, Spatial processing works because you've got lots of multipath, and you can use that multipath effectively. Uh, and at the lower frequencies, you get huge benefits from uh, spatial processing. You know, people don't yet discriminate between those uh, two. The, the, there is a misunderstanding that uh, I've encountered, uh, that we have encountered, and that is that people think that uh, 5G is all millimeter wave, and of course we all know that's not the case, uh, but uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, the uh, incorrect uh, expressions uh, exist. The, the, there is a question about what problems 5G is solving. Uh, if you look at it from the consumer viewpoint, uh, what consumers want is number one, coverage, and number two, cost. The, uh, I already mentioned the issue of the digital divide. Uh, we now have uh, uh, one of the highest costs for broadband deployment uh, in the world. If you go to India, you can get broadband for five bucks a month, and, and somebody is making money at that. So. You've got the impression that perhaps our carriers are focused so much uh, on this future uh, deployment and spending a huge amount of effort on that uh, without considering that the consumer uh, will not benefit from 5G technology and, uh, for some time, and even then only very indirectly. It's gonna take time to build the infrastructure that 5G technology will t avail itself of. You can't have an internet of things without a lot of things out there and these things are not going to be managed in exactly the way we do it today. It's always, there are always going to be changes in the systemology. So I'm not at all suggesting uh, that uh, uh, we should, uh, that 5G is not important, it's crucial, uh, but I'm suggesting that there is a priority issue and that the, uh, you wonder why we should uh, not be uh, uh, emphasizing the existing requirements and the lower frequencies for a whole bunch of uh, different uh, reasons. So uh, there, I don't have the answer for what the recommendation will be, but it's certainly something to think about, about whether the commission can in some way influence the uh, deployment plans uh, and, uh, and encourage more technology use at the lower frequencies. I thought it'd be interesting to, uh, just to emphasize the uh, language issue, to talk about the myths and, uh, 
uh, and realities of uh, uh, some of the myths and realities that we have encountered. Uh, one is that uh, almost universally, the people who do 5G say, well, the smart antennas uh, are much too costly to use at low frequencies. You could only do them at, at high frequencies. Uh, and that's absolutely wrong uh, because uh, there have been systems deployed uh, in large, large numbers, and it always comes out the same that the cost is is lower. Uh, the same thing is true about uh, beam forming versus spatial processing. Uh, spatial processing does take a huge amount of processing power, uh, but uh, we all know that processors are getting so cheap now that it, the cost of a processor is almost insignificant in the, in the cost of a system. And it ends up being a software issue, costs a lot of uh, money and effort to create that software, but once you do it, uh, it turns out that spatial processing yeah, and the frequency bands where it's appropriate uh, is actually much lower in cost than uh, uh, bead forming. Uh, we've got the issue of 5G and, uh, and millimeter wave being synonymous, and we all know that that's uh, not true. Uh, there, there are comments about the, uh, at uh, 5G we have uh, used antenna arrays that are, uh, have as many as 6,428 elements, and they say, well, how can you possibly do that at lower frequency, and it's been demonstrated by people who have uh, spoken to uh, our group that you can achieve uh, increases in spectral efficiency of the order of 10 to 20 times uh, with only uh, eight antenna elements uh, in, a, uh, in a base station. So you don't have to have uh, 6,428 elements uh, to get benefits from uh, uh, dynamic uh, systems. Uh, there's one thing that, uh, that people uh, have not realized. The emphasis when we think about, because we use this term beam forming, is that we get a big advantage in gain <coughs> by having a beam. If you have eight antenna, uh, antenna elements, you get a, a gain of eight times. You've got 64 elements, boy, 64 gain. What you don't realize is that when you have appropriate kind of signal processing, you can not only aim beams, but you can aim the cancellation points. You can aim the nulls. And, and the benefit of aiming a null is not eight times or 64 times. It's essentially infinite. You get cancellation, you, you can go down to zero with interference. So the ability to, to manage both gain uh, and uh, interference at, at the same time turns out to be a huge benefit. So uh, I don't have the, uh, uh, the uh, recommendations on a slide, but let me uh, say them verbally and we'll correct that uh, at, uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, we need to do something to clarify all the terms. I asked our group to come up with uh, a list of terms that uh, starting with what's an advanced antenna system. You could even start with what's an antenna yeah, because uh, those of us that are nitpickers uh, refer to an antenna as being the com a complete array and each of the individual uh, pieces of this thing as uh, elements. But we came up with 128 different terms, uh, which uh, all of them can be construed in different ways. Uh, we think it would be appropriate for the uh, attack uh, with outside help to perhaps come up with a white paper <coughs> that clarifies uh, antenna techno uh, technology terms, uh, because those terms are going to be so important in the future. We uh, are going to come up with a recommendation that suggests that the uh, commission consider ways of encouraging more use of dynamic antennas and uh, antenna technology at the lower frequencies. Uh, uh, this is, a, we understand, an extraordinarily difficult problem because the Commission doesn't dictate uh, technology, uh, but one of the roles of the Commission is to stimulate, uh, it's to enforce the use of the spectrum that it licenses to licensees and to be used in the public uh, interest and convenience. Uh, and uh, so there must be ways for the FCC to, uh, uh, to, to encourage that. And the uh, third recommendation 
uh, is that uh, it has to do with the uh, measurement of uh, uh, dynamic antennas. Uh, there are proposals on the table now uh, uh, to make TRP the standard way. Uh, we don't believe that that uh, is necessarily going to be the right answer. We don't think it accommodates uh, 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 spatial uh, processing antennas. It may not really even accommodate uh, the uh, uh, simplest kinds of dynamic antennas. And I would address you to the uh, one of the charts that will come up in a future one uh, where they're showing the uh, uh, pattern of a uh, millimeter wave antenna compared to a uh, uh, lower frequency uh, antenna. And what they were showing there is how much more coverage you get uh, at the lower frequencies. And what was interesting is that most people don't recognize that propagation at, at all frequencies is essentially the same. The only difference is the aperture uh, and uh, uh, how the uh, energy will penetrate different kinds of uh, obstacles. Uh, most existing cellular antennas are placed in locations uh, that are uh, based upon uh, the uh, where uh, how inexpensive the site is and and how it's related to other sites. Now the uh, uh, millimeter wave antennas, as we uh, will discover and, and have discovered from the second part of, this, of uh, our presentation, are going to be on streets. The one thing we notice is that when an antenna is on a street, the propagation down that street, and, and the example we have is in Los Angeles on Western Avenue, uh, the, uh, a millimeter wave antenna goes out 20 miles. And it will go to the moon, in fact, if you uh, aim it properly. And, so, and somehow or other, uh, the, the regulatory processes have to uh, accommodate you know, those kinds of aberrations as well as the other. Uh, right now, the TRP approach uh, is a statistical approach. Uh, and uh, I guess the only uh, thing we can say in our recommendation will be there's an awful lot of work to be done. We should not accept. Uh, the uh, recommendations of groups that are focused on a single uh, area like millimeter waves that will apply to everything. So that those uh, that concludes my part of the uh, of this session. Greg Greg is going to get into the more interesting part. <laughs> Yeah, we, we also, on this, this slide, we just the first, listed a few of the things we're still studying. Um, just how, just the, the uh, numerical aspects of, of these antennas, how tightly the beams are focused, um, what kind of side lobes we're going to be seeing, and uh, what happens when you take a frequency that you didn't plan to put through it, a spurious emission, um, does it behave the same way as the way you designed your antenna. You can, you can tell which one of these that I participated in and which uh. I didn't. <laughs> but uh, Marty, Marty certainly has presented us with a much further reaching uh, view of the, what this is going to turn into than I ever came up with. And, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, and I, I took on the uh, the other part of it. What's what's happening right now? Um, are there issues that we we need to deal with to help this 5G rollout occur more smoothly? Um, and let me preface this because I know that there's a lot of differing opinions on this. Just to let you know where we're coming from, we are as excited about the 5G rollout as anybody in this room. Uh, we we want to see it happen. and We want to see it happen quickly. But we have certain concerns that there are, cer there are things that will, s not technical things, but um, just societal things that will slow it down. Uh, so what, what the first thing that our group did was we started looking at small cell ordinances. Um, and we looked at. 40 states, cities, and towns. We, we looked at big areas, rural areas. Uh, so there are some states that have, oops, I've lost something. There we go. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'm gonna be careful what I touch. Um, so the, the, we were really trying to figure out what, what differences, because we talked to someone from the National League of Cities who said that there is no one <coughs> rule for a small cell, the way it should appear. Um, and she was absolutely right about that. And when we looked at the different ordinances, we see that different areas have different concerns. A rural area doesn't want to see, or the ones we looked at at least, they don't want to see a tree or a forest of, of trees of, that are small cells. Um, they, uh, whereas in a city, they're not as concerned about that because they already have the structures to mount those small cells as densely as need be. But there's also a lot of commonality. Um, one of the things that we saw that was the most ambiguous, and this is in a state that uh, predefined almost everything that a locality could say, um, yet that locality still stuck something in their ordinance that said that it, whatever goes up has to match the character of everything else that's up there. And that, that could be a wide open question when it comes to to be adjudicated. Um, we ran into this uh, article from the Wall Street Journal just last month. Um, then their, their headline was, cities are saying no to 5G, citing health, aesthetics, and FCC bullying. Um, and uh, it's the Wall Street Journal, and <coughs> I was really quite, uh, I see the bullies are smiling. <laughs> I'm pretty threatening. <laughs> but, and and um, I don't agree with the use of, of those terms. But one of the terms I did like was, um, and this is something that we're not dealing with, but I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, in the headline, they said, those hawking specious safety concerns about the new technology have found common cause with some of America's most pow powerful mayors. So someone, the, the people who are concerned about health issues, which I personally don't believe exist, and I know a lot of people don't believe exist, um, are using other concerns about small cells to form a coalition of anti-small cell people. And that, uh, that can be a little damaging. But you see in this picture, I, I can't say what is a good looking small cell. But I think I can say what isn't this good-looking <laughs> small cell. And I, uh, this picture is one of those. Um, and I, I don't want to impose my own aesthetics on anyone else. But we were trying to think of a way that we could get the two sides together, or the probably more than two sides, but the many sides together so that they could all agree on certain standards. And we, we don't use the word standards, but we, we use the word, um, uh, what did I use? I'm trying to think of what word I used. Uh, <laughs> that's not the word I used, but um, uh, well, best, best, best uh, practices. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, we bandied around a lot of terms, and standards is not a good one because the standard is a very well-defined term that is developed by a standards agency. We didn't want to go to that level. But if we could come up with an appearance uh, doctrine that may, that we may get some acceptance in the, in the localities so that when uh, a request comes for zoning, the zoning won't take the maximum amount of time. Maybe it could, uh, you know, if it was all worded right, it could take hours or days instead of the months that are allowed. Um, the uh, there, the FCC also has a broadband deployment advisory committee, and uh, in reviewing their documents, they have talked about many things. They made uh, certain um, uh, mo let's say model ordinances for states and cities that are very good. But in most of these model ordinances and most of the state rules for the cities, for those states that have them, they leave aesthetics as more of an open issue. They don't, it's not well defined by anyone. So what we're hoping to do is better define it. Why us? Because 
we have the expertise and, and access to the expertise in the antenna working group to know what's possible. <laughs> what can be done with antennas and, uh, and the electronics that goes with them to hopefully make things look a little better. So you know, today, especially with the CBRS uh, start, um, it was the TAC that started uh, the multi-stakeholder process for that uh, CBRS to become a reality. And so we're, we're hoping that the TAC can do it again and that we <coughs> can pursue a similar multi-stakeholder arrangement so we can reach a consensus on what small cell appearance, appearances, what best practices industry can take that will satisfy everyone. That's, that's, a, tall, that's a, a tall order, but um, we won't know unless we try. So as I mentioned before, the, there is trepidation in a lot of communities because they don't want their landscape to turn into a forest of small cells. Um, if it was possible, and this is, this is where our expertise comes in, to come up with, with <coughs> small cell sites that can be shared by multiple vendors, that in itself would help alleviate this concern. And one of the things that we learned about was antenna canisters. So in one uh, you know, less obtrusive looking object, many, many antennas can be supported. And this is an example of one that was provided to us by one of our speakers that has multiple arrays on multiple bands all in this one little uh, four foot by uh, roughly two foot diameter um, can. The other thing we learned, because the FCC <coughs> did go to a lot of effort to come up with regulatory solutions to help ease the uh, 5G rollout, and there are a lot of things that some of our speakers told us are there, but there are loopholes, just like uh, smart people can find loopholes most of the time. One of them was the shot clock. There is a certain amount of time that a locality has to approve an application. And we were, so we just assumed initially that that was a good, was something that would work. Um, as it turns out, um, we were told that they have, if there's a locality that doesn't want the small cell, it's very easy for them to require a small change to the application. It has to be higher by a foot or lower by a foot, whatever change they want to make. And each time they make a change to the application, the shot clock starts over. So these things can drag on and on despite the regulatory clock that says that they have to be ended at some point. Also, we found out about hidden costs that can significantly exceed the regulatory prices. The, uh, you know, uh, the regulations put a, a lim price limit on what can be charged to place a small cell, but then there's a, a very large case going on in Illinois right now uh, where, and this isn't with the locality, but with Commonwealth Edison, the, the electric company, where they have said that wooden pole replacement cost must be borne by the last service added. So if there's a pole that isn't in the best shape, but it's good enough at the moment. However, if you add one more service that adds weight and uh, wind load to the, to the uh, pole, the pole would not, no longer be sufficient <coughs> and must be replaced. And they're saying that the last guy on has to pay for that replacement. And that's in the courts right now, and we don't know how that's going to turn out, but that could be a, a significant uh, impediment to the, the entire 5G rollout process. Also, we heard that some municipalities just ignore the regulations, and so far there haven't been too many re repercussions. That could change, but uh, it all depends on how much uh, everyone wants to get the courts involved. So our thinking was that if a group that contains municipal representation agrees to a set of guidelines, then the individual municipalities across the country may be more likely to accept them with minimum modification or and minimum delay. 
And that same multi-stakeholder group would have the technical stakeholders who would be able to make sure that the guidelines are practical, buildable, and affordable. And if that group can get together and, and make up these decisions, we're hoping that will help ease the 5G rollout. Um, so the, the first task, and going by the history of multi-stakeholder groups that we have already now on the books, the first task is to find someone, a neutral party hopefully, that's willing to host this multi-stakeholder group uh, that worked very well with the 3.5 gigahertz band. And we're hoping we can search for such a group for this purpose. Um, we're, we're proposing that a public notice uh, be, be released by the commission um, to invite volunteers to participate in this process. And uh, obviously the advantage to this process is that if this group makes decisions, they could be used to convince local zoning to quickly accept the plans and as long as they're assured that the best practices are being met. However, as some of our group has let us know that uh, they're concerned that there's a potential disadvantage to the process, that it's not a very quick process. Uh, there, it's a deliberative process and it can take a good amount of time and that may, may not play into the plans to get a quick rollout. Uh, that's where we are at this point. We'll, we will com come up with some real uh, con concrete uh, recommendations by the next meeting, but this is the direction we're going right now. So we'll take questions, Marty, uh, for all the things he said, and I'm seeing the, the, the <laughs> pop, pop, pop. I'm seeing the things I, go up. Okay, you want to move it that way, go Brian? Go ahead. Okay. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this supportive or not? <laughs> yeah, whisper in his ear before he gives you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for that presentation. I, I just like to uh, make some comments on a couple of the things. First, on the priorities of, of 5G deployment slide, uh, where it's uh, talked about that you know while it's not generally understood that 5G will be deployed in lower frequency bands, um, I think that's contrary to some announcements that the major carriers have made, uh, as, you know, including this one, <laughs> that that we are. Uh, planning on, on deploying 5G in all frequency bands and, and for, for coverage uh, as early as next year. So, yeah, I just want to say some time, Brian, that uh, uh, Wall Street Journal article that he just put up mm -hmm. equated uh, 5G and uh, millimeter waves. Sure, so, sure. So you guys need a little better PR. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I, I, I know that. And, and um, you know, just want to point out that, you know, uh, again, emphasize 5G is not millimeter wave. 5G will cover all, uh, and 5G will not be for the dense urban areas. It will get out in, into coverage areas as well. So um, the, the second point on here about consumers <laughs> needing low, need lower cost and better coverage. Yeah, certainly low cost and and better coverage are two important considerations, right? But 5G brings in high speed, low latency. A and why is that important? Well, if you just look at the characteristics of our network over the past 10 years, you'll know why. Uh, video has, has you know, uh, really exploded on the networks. We've seen 470,000% increase in data usage on our network. So it's much more than coverage and cost. There's, there's a lot more that goes into that, and, it, and, it, and that's why 5G, uh, the big push for 5G. We need that high speed to, to support these new services that are coming about. We need the low latency to support these. So I, I think, again, trying to just say low cost and better coverage are the only factors, I think that goes beyond looking at really what's happening on the network today. Uh, and the conclusion that most consumers will not benefit from millimeter wave technology for some time. Uh, again, I think you see announcements of major carriers rolling out um, 5G in millimeter wave and, and announcements of 5G in, in low bands. So I, I think I, I would question you know, that conclusion as well. So. <coughs> 
Uh, moving on to, to Greg's uh, uh, section, uh, he, he started off saying that this is not really a technical issue, and I, I think I tend to agree with that. The aesthetics is, is not really technical. And um, with that, I think we need to take a step back and really take a look at, well, it is, if it's not a technical issue, is it really under the purview of the tax? So one thing we may want to consider. Um, certainly the BDAC, uh, you, you had referenced it in there, uh, has made ref, uh, recommendations. They've come up with model codes for municipalities. Um, there was a declarative ruling in September 2018 by the FCC uh, on uh, wireless infrastructure. Uh, there was a federal working group on aesthetics, you know, that you're proposing. Uh, again, I think you highlighted some of the concerns, you know, that that may ultimately slow down 5G deployments <coughs> if, if such a working group were, were deployed, uh, were, were created and tried to tackle this complex problem. So uh, again, we've, you know, we, we've got some current concerns with that. Uh, many states have, have developed state legislation, as you pointed out. You've looked at, you know, uh, several of them within the working group itself. Um, we think that that's where we need to leave the aesthetic issue is with the municipalities, uh, because if, if one mis municipality has their own uh, definition of what what's aesthetically pleasing to them, <coughs> why should we impose something on another municipality that might have a different set of criteria? We, sh we should leave it up to their own requirements, is, is our view. So let me, let me stop there and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Do we have to separate them? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Are, are, still cage is uh, the answer. Yeah. Are, are, are you still happy that you passed the microphone over? But Brian, you make you make a lot of good points. But despite all the things that you mentioned, we're still seeing examples like the one in that picture. And I have another picture that. Um, has more of a comedic value, but um, obviously there there is something missing, and we don't know what what's missing. But uh, I would love to work with you and and the other providers to figure out what. Uh, at one point in a meeting, you did mention to us that uh, AT and T really doesn't have a lot to do with the installation of the small cells. It's done by its contractors, so maybe. There's some, this is something for the contractors. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna pass microphone back and forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me just mention that one picture of the Wall Street Journal. If you if you read the caption underneath we, of it, we it didn't put the caption. I, it, I, and I'll mention it. It's it says it's an AT&T small cell installation <laughs> in Atlanta. <laughs> I, and I've been trying to track down exactly what small cell that was because, you know, we have different stages of deployment right now. We have test, test cells, we've got into full deployment. We recognize that that isn't the ideal deployment, <laughs> okay? Really? But that's, that's not, you know, what we're looking for for the end result either. And, and again, we're working closely with the different municipalities, understanding what their concerns and needs are and desires are, and, and trying to, you know, get the best fits for the different areas where we're deploying it. And, <coughs> and, and we have come to the conclusion that the, if what you say, and I know, uh, Tom, you've, you've brought up some examples from CTIA, um, that uh, it can be done nicely, and it, it has been done nicely, but there is, there is a uh, distinct dividing line. Any, uh, it seems that the worst looking ones are on wooden poles. And obviously that, if you're putting 800,000 small cells in across the country, you're gonna need to use some wooden poles. So maybe that's where, where uh, we, we should be looking, just at wooden poles, because we also have seen some very nice looking small cells, um, but I, th I think those were put up from scratch. It's uh, not retrofitting a, a wooden pole. I think I'm gonna go to Tom because you've been referenced and <laughs> I know you have feelings about this that are inconsistent with what's been presented. Yeah, thanks for that. And, um, appreciate the opportunity to swap Yeah. Okay. Um, I talked to several operators on this topic and some of our members uh, within CTIA, and there's uh, significant concerns about 
uh, setting up a working group on aesthetics, which is very subjective. Um, we think it's not practical. Uh, understand your concern, and you know different people could interpret what is aesthetically pleasing or acceptable much differently. <clears throat> Uh, setting up a, a broad multi-stakeholder group at the federal level, I think, is, is not practical. Very significant concerns about slowing down uh, deployments of next generation technology and existing technology. Uh, there are a lot of different municipal guidelines out there and requirements. Uh, requirements to come up with some uniform or just sort of a standard set is, is not going to be real practical and would be very arduous. Um, you already have roughly 28 state bills out there. Um, which allow for differences because there are differences in what local jurisdictions and local municipalities want, and they leave aesthetics to the local municipalities, um, which those local municipalities may have their own requirements. Um, but you're going to end up having, you know, literally dozens of these guidelines. It's going to take a long time to create, and then I think there's a lot more risk of slowing down things if if <coughs> municipalities hear that there's going to be some kind of guidance and we have no idea how long it would take and how many people would be involved. They might want to wait till the results of these guidelines come out. And then when the results of these guidelines come out, they may it could drive up <coughs> a lot of cost, uh, could slow things down. Um, and you even mentioned you use the word retrofit, which I think is an even worse, you know, scenario is like things that were deployed on telephone poles. There's lots of stuff deployed on telephone poles today. If you look around, I've looked at, I'm one of those weird techie guys that goes and looks at small cell installations and looks at telephone installations. And you know, they've been deployed for years. And so we're evolving, we're learning more, we're getting, I think, you know, municipalities have different requirements. We don't want to be imposing um, overly, you know, burdensome things on, uh, if we're trying to, you know, facilitate small cell deployment and deployment of next generation technology. So I think, the multiple operators that I talk to who are primarily responsible are um, are very concerned and, and have um, do not think that would be needed or desirable to have this multi-stakeholder group. And, and Tom, you make good points. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, the, the only counter that I would have to that is the pictures that we see, and you can actually walk around some of the streets and see things that, and I won't impose any aesthetics on anyone, but they don't look good. And I don't think anyone would ever agree that they look good. So I, all we're looking for is a way to make sure that those don't repeat time and time again. Yeah, so I need Russ. to um, <laughs> preface whatever I say with, I'm very optimistic about 5G and the deployment. Um, I think we've, we presented in our first meeting uh, a map of what the spectrum is, the coverage, the number of antennas required. Um, if you remember back in March, uh, Commissioner Carr on the FCC has even said the number of antennas are going to be 100 times what they are today with 5G. Um, so what I think is unpractical is for people to think that there's not going to be any pushback. I think we're at the very, very start of 5G deployments, and I don't think the public really has a clue what that really means in terms of what the aesthetics and what the looks are. I can argue of how technical this is. I think it clearly is going to have a, a significant impact on the deployment of this really positive technology that I think all of us want to see happen. Um, I do want the service providers to be involved in this. As a TAC member, I support this uh, um, effort for a public notice. I do, I feel very strongly though that, you know, we're, we're on the verge of some pretty significant pushback from public, from companies, from different organizations, and even, you know, we've covered the RF issue in our working group. Um, I, I think we're just at the beginning. I mean, I, I, I feel this needs to move forward. Okay. All right, we'll try and keep this out and blow all, your, all our extra minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on, on Marty's part, on the uh, <coughs> beam steering antennas or, or smart antennas or however you want to classify. Um, we have, there's a, an issue of, of great um, progress with it because more spectral efficiency, less interference between co-located sites. But at the same time, we have to look at these are 
mechanical, not mechanical antennas, they're not fixed. They don't do just one thing. All antennas, whether they're electronic or whether they're just the standard mechanical antennas that are there today, uh, they all have one thing in common, they will fail. But unfortunately, the other ones fail, they start degrading in signal, and they just basically quit working and you replace the antenna. When you have a smart antenna, it can beam steer, and it can send things in different directions. If it fails, it can dramatically interfere with other things. So we have to take a look at how we monitor that in real live time to make sure these antennas, because it can focus in, say, a typical antenna when, it's, when it goes to the FCC, it's said it's put it at this height on the pole, it's at this direction it's aimed at, it's 120 degrees with five, five degree down tilt, and you can figure out where its pattern is compared to other things for interference. With the beam steering antennas, it can take a beam and it can generate the full strength of the antenna to any direction and multiple directions at the same time. Now, if this antenna goes rogue, because it's run by a processor and it has software in it, which means, as we all know, that things can go wrong. <laughs> so these beams could end up going any direction and interfering with other things. Because, you know, as we all know, the more complex we make things, the more possibility of failure. So we need to look at how we mitigate this by possibly having other antennas that are around that give feedback in real time back if something goes wrong that it can be identified. But, but something needs to be, be looked at that because it, there's a real possibility um, onto that. The, the next one um, is on the, um, on what uh, Greg was talking on, and that's the uh, antennas on the, the small cells. And on that one, I mean, if you look at like the 1937 Rural Electrification Act, that had to be put in because the farmers in the Midwest didn't want power poles sticking in their fields because they'd have to plow around them, you know, and that, that and no one wanted telephone poles. But now we have a telephone <coughs> electrical pole, uh, 24 to 28 poles per linear mile in the United States. No one thinks anything about it. And they're there. Um, this exact same thing will happen with cell towers and other types of communications. No one likes power poles as they are now. No one says that's a, that's a pretty power pole that I have in my yard. <laughs> you know, they'd all rather have it gone. So I think as far as the, the aesthetics go, I think that you will see a change. Right now you're seeing the, the, the base stations and everything else are large and bulky. And as technology goes, you're going to see the antennas and the radios all integrated into to one piece. So I think it's something, as, as he was saying earlier, it's something that the counties, municipalities will do, but eventually you're going to see, you know, things will, will start changing rather quickly. And I don't want to jump to any type of, I don't think the FCC has jumped to any type of regulations onto this, because it, it's going to change rather quickly. And as people get, as, as more and more people started using electricity and everyone couldn't survive with that electricity, they didn't really care what the power poles looked like. And as more and more people are getting more and more dependent upon communications and coverage, and especially as 5G comes out, you're going to see people's how the values of their houses will be dramatically lower if they're not in 5G coverage. Uh, we're already seeing now in the rural areas, we're seeing real estate agents that in their contracts from their buyers, they can't sell the house unless they get a certification of broadband coverage. And so with 5G becoming so important, you're probably going to see the same thing happen. So I think it's, it's going to be more of, as consumers have more demand on it, they really won't care what it, that the the pole the power poles are there or the, the, the towers are there. Yeah, and that I'll cut that short for there. Okay. David. So uh, I, I just want to um, you know echo and, and agree with what uh, both Brian and Tom had to say. Uh, the only thing I would add on top of that is that uh, I think the the group has identified. What, what is clearly an issue, aesthetics do play a, a, an important role, uh, particularly in, in certain areas more than others. Um, uh, but as, as, you, as Greg said yourself, you know, th this is not primarily a technical issue. It's really not a, a technical issue at all. Um, and it, it is being worked out by the equipment makers and the carriers um, working in cooperation with the local governments uh, to meet their requirements, um, which, you know, as we've already heard, very, very um, significantly from one another, um, and, and that that approach will continue. But primarily because it, it is not a, a a fundamentally a technological issue, I don't think it's appropriate for the TAC to pursue this public notice. Okay. Marvin. Marvin. Uh, 
Yeah. I, I find it remarkable that, <coughs> that the industry has supported national rulemaking about shot clocks, model codes uh, that uh, uh, make it easier for them to deploy, but as soon as it comes to aesthetics, they want to do it exa only on the municipal level. Uh, the inconsistency about which issues belong in which domain is striking to me. And uh, I should think that uh, the economics of economies of scale by getting a commonly accepted aesthetic design would more than uh, uh, make up for the costs of the developing the, uh, uh, the guidelines in the first place. All right, so we clearly have, <laughs> I think we, we've covered this one enough for now, but uh, the, the debate will rage uh, within this working group for the next uh, couple of months, and that's probably a, a good thing, except that Julie wants to say one more thing about well, it. Well, Julie, let me, let, me, let me finish our group for, before you make finish your, your comment, because uh, <laughs> I was saving up my last, my zinger for, <laughs> for, for the uh, end Time's of the group. Time's up, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It just about is up, actually. We, you have successfully used the extra time. First of all, to Mark's point, I, I just wanted to reiterate that there are in other industries other than cellular, you know, probably more smart antennas, more spatial processing than there are dumb antennas. So this is not new technology, it's like 20 year old t technology, it just hasn't been deployed. But the real point uh, that I'd like to make, and Brian, I'm not picking on you personally because I think you're a great guy, but I think you, I think you, but, 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 and your colleagues uh, from uh, the uh, other carriers, uh, including you, David, you've got to go back to your PR people and to your management and inform them they uh, have not created a compelling human story for 5G. That is just a reality. And, and you have uh, emphasized that by the comments made here, and even by Russ's comment, and I have so much respect for Russ, I, I resist even saying this, but there is not a compelling case. I, I, I don't know what uh, latency, low latency is going to do for me uh, or for all those people in the rural areas or the people in the ghettos uh, ever. And, and I don't know what uh, high speed is going to do other than uh, maybe at some point when we get to the uh, uh, point where we have uh, virtual reality, perhaps that will be an important subject. So I'm not suggesting 5G is not important. I'm only talking about the balance be between the two. And, and uh, you guys got to do a better job of persuading the public because that issue is going to affect the aesthetics <coughs> issue as well. If you don't, if you, can, you can fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> I, I just made that up. <laughs> but at some point, people are going to start wondering what this, uh, the uh, 5G is going to do for them personally, and why should they uh, uh, have these uh, uh, small cell antennas in the first place. So uh, whatever advice that's worth. Very good. A any comments from those on the phone? Hey, uh, Carly here from T-Mobile. Um, nothing much to that. I just want to echo my support to what Brian, Tom, and David said. <laughs> There's a lot of activity going on in this space, and definitely I don't, I don't think we need to slow down innovation and speed when it comes to deployment. So uh, I agree that a public notice in this space is probably not the best way forward right now. Okay. No, very good. Any others on the phone? <laughs> Julie, last yeah. word on this. Whoever thought discussions of antennas could be so exciting? <laughs> Gail and I were talking last night, saying maybe next go around we'll do filtering. Can you imagine <laughs> the discussions on that? Um, you know, just a couple, a couple quick things, and, and, and not weighing in on yay or nay. Uh, the uh, I just want to sharpen the focus a little bit on some of the things we talked about, the characteristics of the antennas and the, the things that we grapple with that we really can use help on. <laughs> and I actually think as a community, all the, when I say community, all the folks who play in the spectrum uh, don't really grasp <laughs> some of the things that you talked about and the implications of it. 
So for example, the fact that uh, now I am steering beams. <laughs> if you look at how we've done things classically, we've said here's the transmitter power limit. <laughs> in some cases, we've defined the antenna. In the point-to-point -point microwave services, we say here are the characteristics of the antenna and so forth. But now we've got antennas that are not static, and we've got you know powers that are very. Should we move away from what we've been doing in the past, and instead, and I'm not advocating, but should we be <laughs> in, instead just looking at something like a power spectral density at a distance, and and the licensee just has the obligation to meet it, because we have so much more <laughs> flexibility to do things like. Look, I can notch out in your direction. And, and believe me, I've had conversations that go something like this, and I lay this out, and I'll explain, you know, not only the directionality, I'm, I, I'm adjusting the power level at the same time. So I said, well, uh, you got to write it into the rules. <laughs> and, and, and I think, at least from my personal perspective, that's the last thing we want to do <laughs> is lock you in. But I, I think in you know this changing world, whichever band we're talking about, I'm not just talking about millimeter wave, and I know it's a little bit different in terms of the characteristics and how finely you can tune the, uh, the main beam, uh, but understanding that as well as the out-of-band emissions, <laughs> because we everything has been worst case. And then it gets even harder when we start talking about aggregates, <laughs> because how do I do the statistical analysis for beams that are moving all over the place, <laughs> the power is changing dynamically, and the out-of-band emissions are going to change with it and how they add up. So what it's really all about is how we can imp both improve access to spectrum, <laughs> yes, improve efficiency, but reduce the prospects of interference taking advantage of these things as we go forward. And lastly, I'd say is just trying to you know, how we go about educating the community <laughs> about this stuff and not writing 50 new rules <laughs> to, to, to constrain it in some way and lock it in. So th those are the things that I think as we got into this path, uh, you know, are what we're wrestling with <clears throat> and, and hopefully that there's good that comes out of that. So it, great discussion, by the way. Thank you. No, thank you all, and, and you have successfully used that extra 15 minutes very handily, so you're, you're right on schedule now, <laughs> courtesy of, of uh, two of your predecessors running 15 minutes over. <laughs> okay. Yes, you're on. on. Okay. Brian and Russ, show. So next is the uh, 5G and IoT. <laughs> to continue on with 5G. So if we can have the slides, thank you. So uh, first, uh, again, I'd like to uh, point out all the working uh, group team members. Uh, we've got quite a variety as shown on this slide. I'm not going to read off each one uh, individually. Uh, but yeah, good, good participation, uh, good input, uh, good discussions, and, and again, a, a wide variety of participants from, from across, the, uh, across the industry. Uh, so just to refresh our, ourselves on what the charter questions are for our group, uh, again, I'll just highlight some of these, you know, talking about the how are the low, mid, and high frequency bands uh, being used in deployments, uh, status in de uh, of uh, deployment and vertical support and services, uh, what technical steps are taken to ensure deployment of 5G services to rural areas, uh, to what extent is 5G making a difference for IoT deployments, status of satellite offerings for 5G service, and what new developments have arisen that the uh, commission should be aware of and or address. Uh, again, I'm not, I, I left some of those out. I'm not going to go through each of the questions, but they are in, are in the deck. Uh, what did we do this summer uh, besides bask in the sunshine? <laughs> well, we did have a number of uh, subject matter expert speakers uh, come to our group. We looked at the 5G standards activities, uh, some of the 5G IoT implementations. Uh, we had a sub-working group on spectrum topics looking at licensed, unlicensed, shared, CBRS, and dedicated spectrum and worldwide allocations. Uh, another sub-working group on technology uh, related to 5G rural and underserved areas. Um, we worked with the antenna group on the uh, just previously discussed public notice <laughs> and, and uh, also looked at slicing services, uh, vertical specific frameworks, um, got an overview on the RF exposure uh, as well as uh, 
started talking about the topic of 5G security, uh, specifically spoofing and jamming and <coughs> MZ catchers. Um, so let's start with a uh, standards update. Uh, so 3GPP, uh, they're actually meeting this week trying to figure some of this stuff out, like what's going to be in release 17. Um, they want to have that all nailed down by the December plenary meeting, uh, but there is uh, some, as Stephen Hayes will attest to, there's some rather heated discussions this week trying to identify what the content and timelines are going to be for 3GPP release 17. Uh, in the meantime, uh, release 16 is in progress, and that's targeted to be complete in March 2020 uh, with the actual ASN.1 code uh, in June of 2020. Um, right now, the way it's looking, uh, release 17 is on a, a target for a, a second quarter 2021 time frame. Uh, with the, with the ASN.1 freeze after that, unless something <coughs> changes, I know there's a, there's been talk between 15 and 18 month release, and that won't be finalized until December. But this is the the current working assumption. Uh, release 15 is now history. Uh, that's all done. Uh, so that that was completed earlier uh, this year, and um, that now gives us the various flavors of 5G deployment options uh, that are available in the standards. Uh, and that includes the option three, which is the non-standalone using existing LTE and LTE core network. Uh, to provide the 5G new radio in, in non-standalone mode. Uh, the option two standalone mode, which introduces the 5G next-gen core, uh, as well as the 5G <laughs> new radio without the use of LTE. And then various flavors in between, which introduce the uh, 5G next-gen core and the 5G new radio with different configurations. Uh, to allow for different deployment options. So all of this has been standardized, all of this is done uh, with the exception of updates and fixes that are gonna be done in parallel with release 16. Uh, on the topic of security, uh, release uh, 15 uh, did define the 5G uh, security architecture. Uh, release 16 has a number of studies uh, looking at various aspects of security, uh, everything from cellular IoT security <coughs> to network slicing to service-based architecture security and false base stations. Uh, these, this isn't a comprehensive list, but really just a, a summary of some of the ones. And, and again, we as the working group will, will take a closer look at some of the security aspects of 5G as we, as we progress through the rest of the year. Um, the ITU is also busy uh, looking at IMT 2020, and if you recall, IMT 2020 is what kicked off this whole 5G effort. Uh, it, it's really the ITU's effort for uh, the uh, I, uh, IMT 2020 and, and beyond and, and the work that's being led uh, now. Um, the side chart on the right really shows the process, and, and again, there's a number of things going on within the ITU on the left side of this. Uh, there's a number of things going on outside the ITU on the right side of it. And one of those things on the outside, obviously, is the 3GPP standards work, which feeds into the ITU IMT 2020 process. So. You, you have you know, uh, multiple different standards organizations that, that deal with this. Uh, there's a number of uh, ITU recommendations listed there that define the process, the requirements, and, and how uh, a, a candidate radio technology actually makes it to an IMT 2020 uh, defined radio technology. And, and those are all defined as part of those ITU process documents that are listed there. <coughs> Uh, the schedule for IMT 2020, um, as you can see here in this eye chart, <laughs> things are, are well underway. Um, we're right in the middle of steps five, six, and seven right now, uh, which are the candidate technologies have been submitted, the evaluation process is underway to see if those candidates uh, meet the actual requirements that were put forth uh, by the ITU, and then uh, they'll develop the radio <coughs> inter interface recommendations from that in step eight, uh, which will be complete you know, uh, later in 2020, as, as the timeline shows. Um, 
3GPP is not the only submission into the ITU uh, as a candidate uh, IMT 2020 technology. Um, certainly, it's, it's uh, the, the one listed here as, as two submissions. You've got the 5G new radio and a combination of the 5G new radio plus LTE plus <coughs> narrowband IoT. So there's actually two submissions that have come in from, from 3GPP. Beyond that, you'll see on this, there's a number of other submissions that have come in from uh, Korea and China. Uh, those two are pretty closely aligned with the 3GPP new radio uh, technical specifications. Uh, Korea especially is compliant to release 15 and onward. Uh, China uh, has an IMT 2020 5G promotion group that is contributing their work to 3GPP. So hopefully that submission will ultimately be aligned with, with the 3GPP uh, submission as well. <coughs> um, you've got Etsy and the DEC forum uh, that are looking at uh, uh, an evolution of DEC uh, called DEC 2020. And that is uh, another submission that's been made to the ITU. Um, you've got TDSI, which is the standards body uh, that participates in 3GPP from India that has uh, submitted what they call their low mobility large cell, LMLC, uh, which looks at low cost rural, co rural coverage of 5G wireless network services. And they uh, believe that the process works well for countries with a strong industry presence in 3GPP, <coughs> um, but their concern is most developing countries have no way to influence the technology they consume. So that's why they're coming in with, with this particular submission. And then there's a, another submission from China from a company called New Front that has developed uh, a technology called Enhanced Ultra High Throughput. Uh, and that's yet a different technology, totally divergent from, from the 3GPP. Um, there's also other work going on uh, in the industry outside of 3GPP. Uh, one is the ORAN Alliance, and the purpose of the ORAN Alliance is to create open source uh, software running on commodity hardware equipment in order to produce uh, open <coughs> hardware specifications. And these open interfaces um, will enable smaller vendors and operators to quickly introduce uh, their own services, uh, and it will allow operators to customize their network as well. Um, this is a software-defined AI-enabled RAN intelligent controller uh, as, as the heart of the architecture, uh, also better known as the uh, 5G RIC. Uh, the architecture is picture, pictured on the left. Um, we're going to do a more deeper dive into ORAN uh, in, in the next uh, remaining uh, portion of, of our, our work for the rest of this year. Uh, to get a better understanding on how this uh, plays into 5G and, and what, uh, what that might mean overall. Thank you, Brian. I um, want to do a little test here, a little exercise before we start. Everybody pick up your cell phone, or some of you already have it in your hands. <laughs> if you would, log in and, and tell me what you see at the top. Does anybody have a 5G symbol yet? I had one the other day. <laughs> Did, it doesn't count yesterday. I'm, I'm like, I think we're the canary in the coal mine here. We need anybody show 5G? And you got 5G? Oh. Okay. So just it's kind of a, a litmus test of where we are, but it's kind of an interesting test. So we'll check again in December, and hopefully there'll be some 5Gs. Does it have to be a 5G phone? Well, it should be, yeah. Is that a 5G or a 5G? That would help, by the way. So how many phones here are 5G phones? I do. Okay. So second, I just want to call out again. Brian went through those eight questions. We have a really meaty topic here. And I just want to thank the team because we've been diving into it in sort of like all different directions at the same time. So. Um, we've had some two-hour meetings. Um, which we've had two, a sub-working group meeting on Monday, so <laughs> it's a, a pretty big time commitment. I want to thank those that are contributing and participating in those. And yes, um, Lisa's not here, but Lisa and Adam, I lost the bet. You had fewer slides, but I'll get you in December. <laughs> um, let's see. 
That's the last thing I wanted to say, really, um, uh, you know, we, we thank John, but John has been a critical part on multiple teams over the last, I don't know how many years. Um, and I just, I'm really going to miss him. He's been a great technologist, a great member of the TAC, and I just hope we see him back here and wish him the best in his endeavors. Okay, let's talk about some of the things we did this summer <laughs> on the slides. Um, if we can get the slides back up. Okay, so we did, um, we had quite a few um, speakers between uh, both the main working group and the sub working group. Um, on the first one here, you know, 5G ACIA, which is an industry group that's working on some of the ultra reliable low latency communication aspects of, you know, what, how could you build that for specific verticals, industries. Um, particularly, they're kind of going after a TSN like capability. Um, we also, in that meeting, that was presented by Intel. But we did dive into some of the German spectrum deployment that's going on related to dedicated spectrum. Um, so some of their use cases that they're driving, um, and you can look at the membership there, which happens to include our company, but industrial IoT transportation are, are two of the real critical companies there. Then we had a discussion from Milo Medden, um, who is a TAC member. You'll notice some of the um, speakers are TAC members, which you know kind of shows we've got some of the right SMEs in the team. Um, and what he talked to us about, there was a DOD paper that he co-authored, and it was really a discussion um, net net about sub six uh, gigahertz, as well as the DOD's interest or um, I would say um, potential of sharing spectrum as well, and that's being explored I think by um, both NTIA and some others right now. Um, and then we had Dale Hatfield from Silicon Flatirons. He went, he had a round table and he published a report on network spoofing, jamming. Um, there's a lot of industry activity. I think it's early days. Um, Dale's got a second workshop coming up in October that he's invited many of the TAC members to as well as uh, others, um, which we'll, we'll look forward to some of the output from that. Um, Prajwal Kumar from Ericsson talked to us about MC catchers and um, what is used as a subscription concealed identifier. Um, to take a look at how to um, mitigate some of the problems with security as well in 5G. Uh, Mike Nowaki from Addis um, presented to us on neutral hosts, which is a, a very interesting topic John's going to talk more in detail about. David Case from Cisco um, shared with us some of the activities the FCC is doing related to EMF limits and RF concerns. Um, basically, some of the notes there that uh, the standards are developing, test procedures, and the FCC is moving forward with their NOI on this topic. Okay, so next slide. <clears throat> then we had Michael Haw, who some of you may have met uh, <laughs> from the FCC, talk to us about their current spectrum plan and um, you know the things that are in progress, things that have been done. We just wanted to make sure we had a level set, and you'll see a couple slides coming up on that. Um, and then GSMA presented on the, what they're driving with um, their members and most of the carriers on. It's kind of a really cool um, aspect because we had a lot of these questions last year related to slicing, but coming up with about 10 to 12 industry specific slices or slices that would support 10 to, 10 to 12 industry verticals that would be common so that service providers, this slicing being an end to end service, could be able to do slicing handoffs. Um, that work is continuing, but um, a really good presentation and uh, thank them for that. Greg McLaughlin from Charter presented on the incentive auction. Um, this was the spectrum um, repurposing and buyback. Um, some of the learnings from that, um, which we may want to consider in some of the recommendations as we move forward, but you know, there's a, a little bit of a, a I would say, you know, the target was a little higher on the actual um, expectations, I think, in the sale of that. Um, a couple of the learnings were just the long lead time and some of the sort of shadow supply out there reduced the demand a little bit. <coughs> um, Industrial Internet Consortium, as we started to look at some of the IoT applications, they're creating firm frameworks for IoT, uh, industrial IoT. Um, it's still early days, so we, uh, you know, hopefully we'll still be a uh, working group in 2020. We'll be able to check back in with them. And then Kumar Nabular from Digital Globe talked to us about some of the specific geographic information and services from 3D um, high resolution imaging, things like that, that would take advantage of, to Dale's point, some of the low latency and uh, high uh, bandwidth requirements. All right. 
So, you know, as a result of that, um, one of the key topics here for our group clearly is spectrum. And I think every group here that's talked, except for AI, has asked for spectrum today. And believe me, they're going to ask for it sooner or later. But, <laughs> you know, there's really three key components to spectrum, right? There's licensed, unlicensed, and this sort of shared access, dedicated, locally licensed, all lumped into one, like, other bucket. Um, so as we look at that, you know, next slide, um, we take a look at, you know, wireless operators really need a mix of all three. I mean, because all three spectrum types serve sort of a purpose and have different functions from very high throughput to very long reach. Um, you know, it's not, you know, it's interesting when you look at spectrum, of course, you know, just the laws of physics, right? You don't really get anything for free. So if you get really high, you know, long propagation, you're not getting the highest bandwidth. If you get really high bandwidth, you're not getting the best propagation. So, you know, there's a trade-off there. And the graphic goes through this in terms of what each one of those brings between high, mid, and low band spectrum. And a little bit better example is this next slide. And this is from the DOD report. And Dale brought this up, I think, earlier in his discussion. And by the way, I think in that left-hand map, that goes all the way to Moon or to the Moon Street in LA. But um, just a joke there. But um, anyways, the critical piece, we lost the display, but the critical thing, um, when you're looking at millimeter wave propagation, interference is a really big issue. When you look on the left, these are the same geographic you know, slides in terms of a millimeter wave antenna versus a sub six antenna system. Now, if you look, it's mid block, um, at least on the, um, on the vertical, or on the horizontal, but um, not the vertical. So, but on the horizontal, it's right in the middle of the block. So you can see the propagation just shoots north and south really well on millimeter wave. But on the interference side, you end up with a tremendous problem. So when you look at the difference, you're, you're really animating this slide. You know, you see roughly about seven times the number of antennas would be required to get the same amount of coverage you get with sub six. And this was one of the key drivers out of that DOD paper. So, um, you know, again, service providers <clears throat> and others want really need a mix of various spectrum out there. And diving into that a little deeper, <coughs> if you look at this, the current spectrum allocations, I mean, this is what's out there today. Now, the U.S., you know, there's, there's a, the, U, or, the U.S. has not required, um, not required its licensees to deploy a particular technology, um, meaning that the tech, you know, the spectrum could be used for anything, although the service providers are really focused on 5G right now. But um, also available spectrum VAMs out there um, for commercial mobile services today, um, even though they can deploy 5G, um, the low and mid bands are heavily encumbered with existing LTE usage. And so I think as we move forward, that LTE, there's probably the opportunity to migrate some of that spectrum to a 5G um, type system. And then you look at where the FCC has spectrum allocation, or um, what they're looking at in terms of proposed spectrum allocations. Now you notice on low band, there's, it's blank. There's nothing being considered, which is a little bit of a challenge. Um, of course, you know, we shared earlier the spectrum map in the US, I think that was in the, the first meeting in March, you know, pretty much all the spectrums used, right? So it's a, a challenge of either repurposing or moving things in or out, so, um, or sharing at that point. And then the last piece of this is the potential areas um, for additional spectrum consideration. Um, NTI did re release a port report as well um, in late August that I just got a copy of the other day. I think Tom sent me that, um, which was a, a very interesting report on some of the activities or some of the spectrum that could be repurposed as well. But um, if you take a look at um, some of these spectrums that are under consideration, um, you know, there's still a limited amount of spectrum out there. I think the net net message to the FCC is, you know, we want more spectrum. Um, you know, it's weird. I always think of these things. You know, we should do a a, a meeting in a, in like a musical mode, but <laughs> maybe that's a bad idea. But um, I always think of things in terms of music, and I don't know why this ZZ Top song sticks in my mind. You know, give me all your love, and it's like give me all your spectrum. Um, you know, it's like that, that's kind of the motto out here right now. So. Sorry, that's just my own little <laughs> music thing. But um, so at the end of the day, I think we need to consider some of the, the spectrum debate here. Um, 
yeah, we want more licensed. We want more unlicensed. It's not just licensed that we need more of. But, um, you know, the license model only carries so far. Um, right now we're still seeing deployments by the service providers. Um, the other piece is, you know, how many use cases are there that Spectrum would really utilize um, dedicated or locally licensed? Um, and I know the FCC also has um, some concerns or, you know, they have a responsibility back to the citizens. What's the best economic benefit that, you know, benefits society and, and people? Um, there's also public safety issues in terms of what are the QoS sensitive applications that may need spectrum as well. And clearly this is a conundrum because very limited amount of spectrum. So this is what we're going to deep dive in the next two months um, as we get towards December. Um, again, I think some of this work will probably carry over into 2020 um, as we move on. This is not like overnight, hey, this is what we need to do, X, Y, and Z. <laughs> so um, there's a medium amount of work here. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about rural, and then um, I'll do a quick summary and a, a set of where we're headed on recommendations on the overall group. Oh, if you want the mic too. All right. Um, as Russ pointed out, we've been having Monday meetings for about half a year now on. Um, the special needs of the rural market and yeah, honestly this could be a perennial topic of the TAC. It seems like we've spent uh, time every year discussing something related to this. So we've had a number of speakers as you can see from our slide. Charter, uh, my own Madeline Nolan was um, kind enough to present ATSC 3.0. Jerry Cadavi represented Pioneer, which is a co-op in, in Oklahoma, and uh, Lynn does a lot of work for um, Pioneer. Uh, we had Mark Hoyt from NC State talk about a network that he's bringing in. Alex Phillips representing WISPA. Pete Denegi representing Internet of Things America. And finally, Matt Larson representing Vista Beam Internet, which is a uh, fixed wireless access provider um, in northern Colorado, um, southern Wyoming, and New Mexico? In Nebraska. Nebraska, okay. And that was one that uh, Dell set up. So this is a range of, of, of different ser service providers. So if you look at where, um, uh, at Craig's presentation, he brought us a, a very good presentation on fixed wireless access and how that could be used for um, uh, increasing broadband speeds in rural America. And he, uh, he actually said, started out by saying that they were using 5G, but under intense questioning <laughs> by Marty, he, <laughs> he, he said, well, it's sort of 5G-like at this point. We're not actually using 5G. And then when questioned about millimeter wave, uh, he talked about the same challenges that Russ just mentioned, the signal propagation and distance and coverage and that kind of thing. Um, in talking about ATS3, ATSC 3.0, Madeline uh, took us through um, how efficient that, that spectrum could be and how that could be used to solve part of the rural um, broadband um, issue or the divide issue as it's also known. Jerry talked about the challenges of being a, a wireline and a wireless operator and getting spectrum. Um, one of his points was that it would be helpful if the commission would auction off smaller chunks, um, and he suggested by county. Um, there's not a consensus for that on our work group, but if we're representing both sides of it, uh, the guy who is you know, trying to run a network would really like to have smaller chunks so he could compete for those on an economic basis instead of having to compete for the larger chunks. Um, the um, other thing he mentioned, he was the only one to talk about this, is that as far as he knows, there's no 5G roaming agreements yet, and so he felt like there's a good bit of uh, procedural uh, things that are going to have to go in place to, to make this happen. Um, 
I thought Mark Hoyt gave a very interesting presentation. North Carolina is, uh, with the exception of four or five metro areas, a very rural state, has 100 counties, and North Carolina State University has an extension office in all 100 counties. And his proposal um, that he is building out is we're going to build a network and use that as a county extension in all 100 counties and we will uh, work with local partners to either offer uh, public uh, access to the uh, network or business access or whatever we can find a partner with inside of the county and they will reach some areas that there probably would not be another business case to to take uh, high-speed access before a commercial offer probably gets there. Alex Phillips talked about um, you know, WISPA, uh, how I don't think I realize that most of the WISPAs don't, are, are using 100% shared spectrum. And uh, so anything that makes it easier to share spectrum, um, they were very positive on. They're advocating that the educational bands be repurposed and that uh, these independent uh, service providers have fast and fair access to infrastructure. Specifically, they meant building access um, um, as well as the standard infrastructure that we talk about, whether it's a pole or um, a right of way or some other type of access. Pete. He talked about the Internet of Things. He was the most positive on 5G. Again, not there. He, th he thinks it will improve the economics of doing um, uh, big agriculture. Um, he was also on the smaller blocks of licensed bandwidth. And then finally, Matt Larson, who again I mentioned was the fixed wireless provider. Um, he said they're just upgrading the 4G. Coverage is way more important to them than speed, um, which was important. He doesn't see a lot of benefit from uh, 5G in his specific market. And um, the things that he does is like he'll go in and build an eight foot tower on a farm, put a directional antenna and use 900 um, megahertz signaling for a very long report um, back to a, a, a system to report on the soil mo moisture or nutrient level. And so very targeted. He <laughs> works with all kinds of farmers and business owners. He works with the local tractor franchise that he has to put a system in every one of these things. So low to moderate bandwidth long distances and um, that's his business model and he seems to be fairly successful with it. So we kept going through this and I was getting, I, I sort of keep up with the daily announcements that uh, announce all the different uh, spectrum actions and the things that the commission is doing. So I decided that it would be helpful to try to summarize those on one slide to show the progress that's being made to support the rural market. And so on the left-hand side, you see um, the spectrum actions that have happened. I won't necessarily go through all of them, but I will mention um, that even though it's at a very high band, uh, you know, the commission has taken action to increase the amount of spectrum in the very high bands, 3,400 uh, megahertz uh, being auctioned in uh, December. They're repurposing a significant amount of bandwidth in the mid bands and going to auction another 70 megahertz off uh, the CBRS stuff we've talked about. And then uh, they continue to repurpose low band um, for mobile broadband. In other actions, they have um, had a number of financial awards that they've come up with. They have added up 1.5 billion to reach 713,000 homes with high-speed broadband defined as 25.3. Another almost 5 billion 
um, that's coming out uh, this year um, going into the fund. They've created the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which they funded at $20.4 billion over 10 years. They have an initiative now on broadband mapping uh, to improve the state of the data. They continue to focus on how to improve uh, health care with the Universal Service Fund, and they've created this $100 million pilot over three years. Uh, the chairman has set up his Precision Agriculture Advisory Council to get further info on this, and um, the USDA has allocated another $600 million in 2018 and another five hundred and fifty. million uh, in 2019 to enhance broadband. So when we talk about needing more things, I think it's important to acknowledge that the commission is uh, heavily engaged in helping to close this gap as well. And, and the fact that it's a priority, it's, um, uh, is evident at least to those of us who are watching the rural space. We always want more, but they're doing uh, a lot of work and adding a lot of money into that space. Takes us to the next slide here. We showed this last time, so just reiterating the point that as we go through the urban, suburban, um, rural split, um, we've already talked about some of the things that we're not sure that 5G will, will address. We don't think 5G as defined as the uh, millimeter wave is going to address the coverage um, or the antenna costs um, in a way that rural companies will be able to participate. There are some backhaul advantages um, um, to the higher bands that uh, different people have talked about, but in general, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And we've seen that in the way the spectrum is being allocated and the proposals to repurpose it. There's going to be fixed wireless access, there will be cellular, there will be uh, fiber to the home, there will be any number of different types of services that contribute to closing the digital divide. And then this is a slide we pulled out of Matt Larson's presentation because last time We've got um, a degree of pushback on whether mi a millimeter wave was going to be effective in, um, in the rural market. And so Matt, we didn't ask him to, but he had this in his presentation and he graciously agreed that we could use it. Um, he just basically said millimeter wave is not going to be useful outside of the most densely populated areas in his market. Um, and when you go down to the sort of the payoff, almost no demand for license spectrum and millimeter wave in his, in, in his market. So, um, and that's, you know, the reality of, of you know, his checkbook-based uh, business decisions. Okay, so this brings us to, uh, I'll skip one and then Russ can skip back. No, the um, how, how to break up and come up with recommendations with all the different input we've had was problematic for us. So we divided it up into areas that we thought needed more debate as we try to come in fourth quarter with um, some measurable objectives or recommendations. And the license spectrum is definitely one. Uh, drive more spectrum sharing. Uh, the, even the DOD supported that in theory in their paper. Uh, more sharing uh, based on region, based on time, uh, different types of um, interference levels that could be measured. All of these things are, are, are ways to enhance current initiatives uh, and consider what the optimal license sizes are and terms to promote rural deployment. Unlicensed spectrum, uh, there are a couple of proposals at the commission to increase the power output of the 3.5 gigahertz band uh, to allow the reach to be extended. And, uh, you know, looking around the table, we didn't understand 100% of the negatives to that, but the goal of increasing the power to extend reach was something that we supported. Um, neutral host, 
Um, neutral host, I, I, I'm not the hugest fan of. It's, it's a proposal in the industry, though, to have a, a, a locally built network, uh, essentially a dumb network, and then service providers bring applications or access to it, and they sell through and end up having applications that uh, reimburse the builder of the network for their their service so it allows people to reach um, different um, different service areas with their services without having to invest in a in a really large um, network expense up front and finally um, commission oversight um, use funding to encourage high performance networks and um, the enforcement question was one we know that when uh, spectrum is released there's typically performance milestones when money is given uh, particularly around broadband now there they've got it, it comes with strings attached they have to build out a certain amount of their network um, enforce those time frames and uh, make sure that um, if the rollout isn't following what was committed that the commitment eventually matches the um, uh, the commit the um, the requirement and if not somebody else who wants to build out gets a chance to get in there and build it so that back to Russ yep thank you John so we did the same sort of exercise on the um, overall recommendations for the group Gro broke it into four buckets um, the first one being removal of barriers, and we've talked about this in a number of aspects, um, but it's kind of an FCC program focused on consumer education. There's a lot of misinformation out there um, from deployment issues, RF concerns, et cetera. We've had a couple speakers, and we'll try to get to a um, more actionable recommendation in the fourth quarter. Security, um, there's work to be done here clearly on radio spoofing and jamming. These are real issues. Um, and you know, part of it could be the FCC endorsing industry solutions. Um, we also need to coordinate. There's a CESR group that's um, somewhat working on this area. And then with regard to spectrum, spectrum, which is a really meaty topic, and there's that ZZ Top song again. Um, <laughs> shared spectrum opportunities we need to explore beyond CBRS. That's just launching. You guys are all going to have that in your head when you leave today, um, the song that is. Additional low mid-band spectrum opportunities. Uh, dedicated and locally licensed needs. Um, you know, part of this could become competitive to other countries. Top 10 industrial countries are now doing dedicated spectrum op offers. And if the U.S. you know doesn't have that, what does that mean in terms of us competing to um, get some of those industries here? And then additional potential repurposing as well. And and the last bucket is IoT, which we're going to uh, do a deeper dive as well. Leading um, some of that focus will be um, interest areas around industrial, medical, transportation, and then the related spectrum implications. Is there a dedicated spectrum needed? Just kind of a tie into the spectrum working or spectrum recommendation. And what FCC role is there, if any, in expanding IoT deployments? Um, and then, last slide I have here is a summary of some of the key points we've discussed. You know, obviously, spectrum availability and management are critical to success. Um, and that includes low, mid, and high bands. Um, you know, really it gets down to that, what's the best path to maximize utilization? <coughs> um, spectrum sharing and dedicated use have significant opportunities. We do have this uh, area of lack of sub-6. You're seeing other countries, particularly China, deploying sub-6 as their um, standard or as their uh, model moving forward right now. Um, standards are definitely on track. Um, ITU, a little bit of concern with the six um, proposals there. We really need a single global um, standard to uh, drive the technology and deployments. Uh, IoT, smart factories, two connected transportation are going to lead deployments. Rural is still a challenge, as John mentioned. Um, there's no single magic bullet there. Uh, 5G security is improving. We're seeing a lot of activity there, but it's yet um, to be proven. Um, there are some issues that need attention. We'll be taking a look at from spoofing, jamming, privacy, data security, and massive IoT. Um, and then opportunities related to ORAN or Open RAN 
can push innovation and agile deployment. So there's a positive aspect, and we'll dive into that. So we, we still have a huge amount of work on our plates. Um, so let's, let's get down to uh, business and get that hammered out in the next couple of months. Um, and we just made it under the 2.30, of course. I'm sure there's no questions, so we're <laughs> done. Yeah, are there, uh, we're going to have to, given the time, we're going to have to be somewhat abbreviated. We, we were doing very well with the first, uh, our part, we got done early. <laughs> AI got done fingers. early. But from then on, minutes here. <laughs> Steve, go. The shot clock is running out. <laughs> I have to work that into the lyrics. <laughs> Greg. More, more serious. Um, yeah. it, if we're newly deploying 5G, if these active antennas are really there and can really be deployed, then the need for all of this spectrum is open to question in my mind. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, was it two or three years ago we had a, a talk, uh, that, or there was more than enough spectrum, and I think it was one of the TAC members, it was how efficiently it's being used. And um, you know, there was a, I believe it was a NSF project, funded project that looked into that topic. But yeah, I, I think some of the work Marty is proposing, even on dynamic antennas, is gonna make a big difference as well. Um, so it's a good point. Um, I'm, I'm going back to your slide where you showed the comparison of low, low band to high band. By the way, low band, that's not low band to me, but I guess in this industry it is right. sub six. Um, low band to me is anything with a megahertz in front of it <laughs> or behind it. Um, I think that was a low band, wasn't it? Sub six gigahertz. Sub six. Yeah. So for, right. uh, I'm wasting time, I'm sorry. Uh, in the, In your diagram you were comparing propagation and obviously the, the, the as expected the, the lower frequencies had better propagation than the higher with a 7 to 1 ratio of cells. Doesn't that 7 to 1 ratio of cells also help you out with, with uh, handling more users? So the propagation really doesn't matter at that point? If you've got the users, yeah. Well, it's Los Angeles for them now. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a Los Angeles example. Yes. So. Right. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a fair point as well. I think, though, when you're looking at um, deployments in rural areas, there's a significant difference there, too. Granted. Yeah. So there's, there's trade-offs, uh, clearly, in terms of number of users per cell site, things like that. Okay, thanks. Any? Oh, Adam, you have one. Yeah. So um, you, know, you, you have the antenna working group, and there is sort of a basic question that you can ask, okay, and that is, uh, given the maturity of the antenna technology that exists today, you have things done in the lab, you have some things done in deployment, uh, you have broadcasters with ATSC3, and if you were to go out and do a national map of what is the bits per hertz that are actually available in a given area, what fraction of that is actually utilized? Okay. I think it would be very informative. And one of the questions for the antenna group is, what is really realistic over time in terms of what the technology can deliver? Because that then feeds into that 5G, the 5G equation, okay, of what will MIMO and the other beam forming techniques actually bring you. Uh, and then I think it comes to uh, sort of the question of do we really have a spectrum scarcity problem or not? Yeah, since I spent a lot of time on this one, you have to have per cubic meter yep. and you have to have. <clears throat> A, yeah. a cost associated with it because as, as Marty always points out if you have infinite amount of dollars you, there's no there yeah. is no issue because you can put a, an antenna every 
every but, but it, meter it, and you're, yeah. you're in good shape. <laughs> so, so the question is what's practical and what's not? Yeah, what are it's a practical issue. That's the point yeah. I'm making. Yeah. A, a comment from the bridge? Please. Yeah, Hi, it's, it's Kevin Sparks. Um, one, in, re in response to the last couple of comments about spectrum and, you know, do we really need more or not, um, 5G brings a lot of technologies that will, you know, in, uh, increase spectral efficiency. But the other thing that we really haven't talked about much in here is the fact that the, uh, a lot of the industrial use cases which require uh, very low latency and very high reliability. The techniques, uh, the URLC techniques and other techniques you need to apply to those kind of high value use cases actually decrease the spectral efficiency because you're trading off spectral efficiency against the other uh, performance characteristics. But they're high value applications, so you want to be able to serve those. So um, there are, you know, so 5G brings, brings things that improve the the efficiency, but all increases that necessarily depress the spectral efficiency, um, and so therefore, you know, you, you've got to keep that in mind as well uh, when you when you consider whether you know the spectrum increases are needed or, or not. Okay, Len. Yeah. So. Um, Thanks, one, Kevin. One of the other things on the dealing with the, the frequencies is. You know, the frequency may be there, but is it really available for those that need it to go ahead and go ahead and, and be able to use it? So you have part of the problem is, is you have your, uh, uh, you know, your 3G, 4G, and, you know, having the 5G as far as all operating together as far as out there, if, especially if you're operating standalone systems. But, um, you know, when, when you look at it, those that hold the spectrum, they're using quite a bit of it as far as in the in the larger communities, as far as in the urban areas, but in the rural areas, it may not be actually used as far as today. So, what uh, the things are is what can you do to go ahead and get that spectrum that's out there today to to go ahead and be able to use it, and if you can't, then you need to look at uh, auctioning off you know additional spectrum or getting spectrum out there as far as on a county basis or whatever to to allow you know others that have an interest in providing the service in the very rural areas to go ahead and get out there and to be able to do that. So that was that was part of it. The other the other piece is is um, you know when we look at 5G um, when we talk about network hosting or or uh, the, having a neutral host um, anything that we can do to help uh, lower the cost as far as serving in the rural area is probably uh, paramount as far as trying to actually get that service out there. So uh, if you're trying to do a 5G service in a small rural community, you know, 2,000 customers or 2,000 people or something like that, you know, you obviously you can't afford a, um, a core, so you're going to have to lease it from somebody or operate through something. So there needs to be something that's placed out there to in place to actually make that easy to, uh, to go ahead and put together and, and operate simply. So that would be, um, you know, and, and if a large carrier would go ahead and lease, then that'd be great. But I'm just saying just different, different things that could, could be looked at as far as to cover that, and that would be just some other topics as far as for the very, very rural area trying to, trying to get services out there. And, and Marty, I know you've had a lot of good ideas as far as providing services in different ways, but I'm just thinking of the, um, where you have a certain household per square mile that those could be impacted and, and to be able to serve those while you have the very rural area, you're just gonna have to use something else to cover it. All right, Julie, last word. So, uh, not to add to your pile of work, but I will. <laughs> um, agree with everything that's been said. Just uh, what has always troubled me a little bit, when, and I'm sure some of you have seen this too, you go off to international conferences <laughs> And you hear about, well, we've got 200 different uh, experiments going on, not just looking at the technology, but the applications and the connections with the verticals. And uh, latching on to what I think Mark said before, it's always the applications, what you can do with it, that drive the service. Yeah, we have to provide the spectrum, and we have to get rural coverage and all those things. And if, if there's anything you can do to give us some insight, how are we doing in the United States relative to uh, the connections with the verticals. Because we talk a lot about, we have the capabilities, 
uh, whether we're talking energy or we're talking transportation or education. And uh, it would be really helpful. And I'm not talking about regulation here. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all, I think, trying to make sure that we lead the world in 5G. And, and uh, you can debate about what that means in 5 But uh, it would be helpful to get some insight to how are we really doing on those fronts. Sure. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that's a fair question. And, and there is a lot going on. Uh, I yeah. just that we haven't highlighted it yet. But certainly, we'll, we'll take that on. Yeah. Good. 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 So let's close. Um, first reminder, December 4th, get together. Actionable recommendations, we need them. Um, seeing where we are, a lot of good work. But, but getting down to those actionable recommendations is really, really the key point. December 4th is the date of the meeting. We'll need to have the draft recommendations and pretty well finalized recommendations by the middle of November so that they can undergo a review. And I don't know whether you have a specific date, but it's mid-November time frame. We'll get that up. OK. Um, beyond your actionable recommendations, we need topics for next year. So be thinking about those. Oh, 5G. <laughs> oh, you six one. Filters. Beyond that, I do want to thank once again the the chairs, co-chairs, sub working group chairs, and all of the the work that you've done. Certainly, a lot manifest today yeah. in, in the energies and efforts, and all of the subject matter experts. So we, we really do. We ought to charge for the the opportunity to listen to some of the. the people that come to talk to our working groups, because they're really top, top people in the world and in the various disciplines. And, and that's a terrific thing. So we really appreciate them. Uh, also, clearly appreciate the liaisons who uh, are so helpful in making things happen within the group and in serving as a funnel for the information into the FCC. So great work. Applause. Thank you for each of you for the work that you're doing. With that, I'll turn things to Michael for any comments you have. Yeah, I just wanted to extend our appreciation to our staffs who are preparing all the uh, setting up the rooms, the lunch, cleanup, and everything else, uh, plus the uh, assisting me uh, making this meeting to happen. Thank you all. And on that, of course, Brian, thank you for buying lunch. And uh, thanks to all of you, and thanks to Dennis for all of the time and the energy that you put into making all this stuff happen. So thank you. Great. Have a wonderful rest of the week. And we'll see you in December, if not before, and be talking to you on the phone and through the various working groups. Go, go, go. Hey, Brian.